This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geeks, show number 275, recorded on uh, August 25th, 2016. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets. News reviews, product updates, and conversation all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Carlson, broadcasting live from the average guy at TV studio in a beautiful 75 degrees in sunny Bellevue today. Just one of those uh, Chamber of Commerce days here in Bellevue. Uh, and of course, we're missing Mike Weeger tonight. Mike is out traveling for work, and so usually I bounce that weather information off Mike, and he's he confirms because he lives, he doesn't live too far away, but. Of course, we post a show with world-class show notes each week out at the Average Guy. TV. You can join us live on our new mobile app now, and I want to thank LastPass for that. They've renewed for another year, and so if you want to head out to HomeGadgetGeeks.com, big buttons for fat fingers if that's a, a problem, just click on that. It'll automatically take you to wherever, either iPhone or Android device uh, for the app. Great way to listen to the podcast on the road, Home. GadgetGeeks.com. Don't forget that Home Gadget Geeks is a part of the Geeks Network. Find the link to this show. Many other great podcasts out at thegeeksnetwork.com. And, of course, don't forget we have the Home Server Show Meetup coming up September 17th. There is still time to join. Head over to homeservershow.com. Uh, look for the Meetup 2016 link that is out there, all the details about how to get involved in that. And there's still time to make it. Uh, if you want to come in, uh, get a hotel room and join us for the weekend. Lots of good fun. Saturday at the Microsoft headquarters in Indianapolis. Sunday morning breakfast at Waffle House, which is always good. I'm going to take my laptop and open it up and connect to the just the awesome Wi-Fi that is there at Waffle House, and so we're excited to be there. Again, that's the 17th and 18th of September. There's still time to sign up if you want to do that as well. Don't forget Patreon link out at theaverageguy.tv, or you can uh, access that at theaverageguy.tv slash support is the way to do it. And we're still, we still have a bunch of stickers to give away, so if you want to get those, and when I say a bunch, we're – down to about half, and I'll be taking what I've got left over, and we'll be uh, we'll be getting rid of those at the home service show meetup. Uh, I shouldn't say that because if you're coming to the meetup, uh, uh, anyways, if you want to get one of those and you're not coming to the meetup, jump over to the Patreon link at theaverageguy.tv. You can pick one up for as little as three bucks in a month, and uh, we'd love to have you do that as well. Also, don't forget fantasy football league draft is coming up September 6th. Is what we're doing. If you were in the league last year and you want to join us, let us know. If you weren't in the league last year and you want to join us, let us know. So both ways, let us know. Send me an email, an email Jim at theaverageguy.tv, and uh, we'll get you hooked into the league. We had a ton of fun. Mike and I had a ton of fun doing that last year. And if you want to join us, it would be great to have you. So join us again. Send me an email, Jim at theaverageguy. Dot TV. All right, I warned you guys for the last couple weeks that if you came to this podcast hungry, yeah, you might buy the whole the whole supermarket. So we have been talking about this for a while in kind of a grill tech uh, episode. We're going to talk a little bit about what it's hard to believe as I looked at all the technology that's gone into grills these days. There is a ton of stuff out there, and so I got two guys who are obsessed maybe a little bit. I know Mark, you for sure, but Mike, you guys yeah. are. Mike Howard's with us. Mike, welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you. And Jim, you know, I installed Wi-Fi, I said internet, at that uh, Waffle House for you up there in Indiana. Nice. Just for your visit. I so like you, it. Thank you. If you had the special codes to get access, you know. Maybe some, they could show up in my email. Uh, and no. then I would sit there all morning working at a Waffle House while I... <laughs> Drink free coffee and uh, not going to happen. <laughs> no, uh, it's not going to indeed. And then across from across from Mike is Mark Robson. Mark's first shot at being on uh, on Home Gadget Geeks. He reached out. Actually, Mark, I watched you uh, kind of buy all these grills through the Facebook group. If you go to theaverageguy.tv/slash Facebook, and I was I. I didn't know you very well at the time, and I'm like, man, what the heck is this guy doing with all these grills? <laughs> Tell a quick story. Your wife uh, kind of put the kibosh on some of that. How, first of all, how'd you do all this? Welcome, and how'd you do all this, and what did she say to you? Well, it started out that I wanted to get a um, what's called a Komodo grill, which is one of these big um, oval-looking grills that everybody knows a big green egg, but they're ridiculously expensive. Like up here, they're you're looking at $1,800 Canadian to get one. And that was a big expense for something that I didn't know if I was going to like. So I shopped around and I ended up buying this one called the Acorn Komodo. And one of the best things about it is that it's a hacker's grill. So if you go onto the Komodo forum, 
uh, Komodo Guru forum, there's all guys that show you how to modify them. And oh. I like hacking stuff, so that was a little bit towards it. So I bought that. Um, I had a big stainless steel cast iron grill, four burner, side burner, rotisserie, monster grill. And when I got my charcoal Komodo, I used it twice in a year and a half. So the <laughs> fall, a summer year and a half later, I'm talking to my wife. I'm like, you know, I want to go and buy a, a Weber, 22 inch Weber kettle, the one that everybody knows of as a, as a charcoal grill. And she said, well, that's fine, but two grills is enough. So you want to keep getting another grill, you have to sell one of the ones you got. So I put it on uh, Kijiji, which is our version of Craigslist, and I sold it in a day. I just wow. got off my deck, 80 bucks, take it away. It needed repairs. It needed some TLC. And then I went and bought myself a Weber. Actually, I bought myself a Napoleon kettle, which I took back a week later and bought myself the Weber. And so that was, uh, look at my schedule, about a year, two years later. So that was last summer. And then last Christmas, last September, we had a big party, big barbecue party. And I did, I cooked for, on two separate grills, I cooked overnight on one. Then I cooked on the acorn during the party. And I cooked for three hours on a Weber during the party. And I laid out this huge feast of, protein, just meat, chicken, <laughs> uh, atomic buffalo turds, onion bombs, uh, all these all these barbecue appetizers. And I told my wife, like, I need another grill. I, I've, I filled two grills up for too long. I need to get a third grill. And she, she looked at it and she said, you know what? She says, you're using it. So I should find one, buy one. So last December in the middle of winter, I found the guy selling a grill and I got a really good deal on it with a, uh, a PID controller that we'll talk about later. And, uh, so I bought that one. So then fast forward another six months later, I'm like, you know what? I got three grills, but I really want to get a pellet grill. So I started looking around on, on Kijiji again, and I found a guy selling a pellet grill for a third off, a year old. And it was uh, five hours away from home, but I had a buddy that lived in that town. So he went and bought it for me, and I went and picked it up three weeks later. So now I got four grills. <laughs> and a couple weeks ago, I used three of them at once. Mark, so, um, which, which pellet grill did you get? The Traeger Tailgater. Okay. And I'll probably trade that in on a larger one, whether okay. it's a, a Traeger or a Green Mountain Grill or a Rectac. Um, this one's big enough to do two pork shoulders, and that's pretty much it, or maybe three racks of ribs. But what I make up for in size for the tra on Traeger, I, I do two racks on a Traeger and two racks on a Weber. And I'm, yeah. Man, so, I yeah. want to be your friend <laughs> just so I can come <laughs> over and – and I, I, Omaha is a little far. You're located in Calgary. I uh, know Calgary. You're Ottawa. located in Ottawa. Sorry, I was talking to somebody the other night in Calgary. Uh, so you're up on the east side of Canada, and you've directly been north a, of New York. Yeah. How long you been there? Uh, I've been in Canada for 42 years, and I've always lived within four hours where I am. And is it true that Canadians are the nicest people on the planet? Is that true? Some of us. <laughs> <laughs> it depends where you go. Is it uh, are some parts of the country more friendly than others? Is that how they they yeah. gauge it? Yeah, out east is extremely friendly. Okay. Uh, like in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI are, are ridiculously friendly. Um, you get towards Quebec, the deeper into Quebec you go, the, the less friendly they are if you speak English. That's because they're French. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, a lot of that going on. Um, but you get some places like Quebec City. You can go through Quebec City and they're extremely friendly, hmm. which is further in the Montreal. Yeah. But there's no real language battle in Quebec City, where there is right. a language battle in Montreal. Quebec City's up the river, right? Yeah. You go up north, north and east to get yeah. to Quebec City. Yeah. It's the uh, it's basically just where the narrows of the Quebec of the Saint Lawrence are. Yeah. Cool. Well, good to have you on. You uh, I, I, again, you were hanging out on the Facebook page, and we started talking about this. And uh, Mike, uh, there you've. Mike Howard, you've gone through a little bit of a resurgence, right? Would, is that is that okay to say for you? Yeah. In in grill, it is. You know, I've always had a gas grill and always had a small charcoal grill for when we go camping, and and had a offset uh, smoker too. And uh, you know, I I've smoked on it maybe three, four, or five times over the ten years I had it. But if you if you ever smoked with an offset smoker or, or something like that, if you're not if you're smoking with something you bought at Home Depot. Or Lowe's, you know, one of the one of the sub thousand dollar, I don't know what the, the price point is there, but one of the cheaper smokers that is an offset smoker, it, your biggest battle, and I imagine even with the other ones, your biggest battle is always temperature control. Keeping the temperature the, the temperature you need to. And the longer the smoke, the harder it is. You know, I've I've even got myself what's called ashbound, where no matter how much more coals I added, 
I couldn't keep the temperature up because the coals I was adding were being suffocated by the ash from the previous coals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's and that's a mistake I made. I got myself into that, and now I'm, you know, eight hours into a rib smoke, and what do you do? Um, so it's, you know, it's it's one of those things that, in, in once you get good at it, and I'm not good at it. So as we as we go through this show, let's first off say I am not a pit master. I am not an expert in any of this. Same here. Yeah. Well, it's um, it's good because this is the average guy network. Yeah. And uh, and so we're just here learning, uh, learning together. Mike, let's dig in a little bit. We uh, let's start with you. We you've kind of moved into or you have gotten hooked on kind of these pellet smoke, yeah pellet smokers. And are is you familiar right? with the pellet smoker at all? I am. I am not. I bet Mark is for sure. Well, good. I'm glad you're not. Yeah, I not. Brought, I brought a pellet. No, I'm, oh, good. Yeah, no, I'm a, just to set the record straight, I'm a gas grill kind of guy. I was a Weber uh, charcoal for a lot of years, but uh, maybe 15 years ago, switched over to gas. And I actually have a – my gas grill was built in, in 1996, and I have uh, – I just love it. And it's uh, it's all seasoned up, and I've replaced everything with cast iron, and I've had to bolt the thing together and replace a few parts. I think that's on its last legs right now. But I love my seasoned grill. I love, you know, I know the grill. I know the hot spots. I know where things are. I know, you know, how to cook on it. And so for me, I'm not a switch around. Or a, I look at the new grills, to be honest, and kind of go, eh, I'd like my own. You know, I modified mine to be the exact way I want it. You know, I'm a hacker too, Mark. So I kind of hack on my grill. So anyways, that's that's my story. Mike, you showed us a pellet there. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, there is no one way to do any of this stuff. You know, for me, if I'm going to grill, I'm going to do it on my gas grill. If I'm going to smoke, I'm going to do it on my Rectech pellet, pellet smoker. Um, you know, for me, smoking is low and sm slow. Yeah. Cooking at a low temperature, let's say 225, 250, for many hours. If I'm cooking burgers or a steak, I'm going to do it on the grill. So I mentioned before how I got ashbound in my uh, last smoke on my old offset smoker. Well, that offset smoker meaning the the wood, the heat source, or the coals or whatever is in a box separate. You know, that's off to the side of your where you're cooking your food, and the heat passes underneath it. So it's not it's an indirect heat that's happening. So I disc, I was looking at getting a more expensive that offset smoker, something with a heavier gauge metal, something like that, and then I decided. Let me look at these pellet smokers and give them one, you know, one last look because I've always thought they were a gimmick and not something for a real cook. And there's still people who think that that if you're you're not really cooking with wood, if you're cooking with pellets. But you know, Mark, you mentioned you have a Traeger, and Traeger is the ones who invented this category, with uh, first coming up with a byproduct of their wood mill to heat homes, these pellets. And then they, they took that one more step further and said, hey, let's have year-round sales, and they came up with these little little wood pellets. This this is you know this one's probably broke so it's not quite as big but that's about the size of all of them little bitty you can see that right and in it just compressed or yeah. is it just yeah compressed and no binder typically okay. yeah no, no binder so no glue it is used the natural wood and there's all types this one I think is 100% hickory you can get mesquite you get peach you name it you can get it most of them you gotta you gotta watch out for the different uh, pellets some of them and you may not care some of them that say hickory is like a 60% oak, 40% hickory, but you can, if you want, and that's fine, you know, um, if you want 100% hickory or 100% maple or whatever, that's out there too. So there's lots and lots of pellet um, choices that you're out there. But I, I have, vendors. yeah, pellet vendors um, do a little bit of research. The price of these is not that bad. Do you, you know, do you Amazon them? That, yeah. That's what I've been buying mine off of Amazon. Yeah. So Re Rectech, who's my uh, pellet grill, the grill, and I'll show you that in just a second. I got some from them, but I'm also buying some from some other vendors because they didn't have the. I wanted some particular 100% woods, 100% hickory, 100% mesquite, that kind of stuff. So I had to buy from somebody else. But um, the way a pellet smoker works is you have a hopper that holds your pellets. And in the case of mine, I can hold 40 pounds of of pellets. And that hopper has an auger, most likely at the bottom of it, that is slowly feeding these pellets into a firebox, a little bit of firebox. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can show you this, Jim, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Can you see that? Uh, if you can blow that picture up a little bit, we can. Let's see. Can I blow that picture up? There you go. Keep going. All right. Scroll down a little bit for me. Yeah, awesome. See it now? Yep. yep. So on the, oh, on the 
on the left hand side is the hopper in this case, and I think this is actually a Traeger. Um, and then you can see a little screw drive, right? Yep. That screw drive is pushing pellets into this in the far right hand side, a firebox, a little fire pot. And in that fire pot is a little um, probe, and that probe is fed by electricity that heats up and sets the, the wood on fire. And then you generally have a fan that is blowing that heat around the, the inside of the, of the smoker. And the speed of that, that, um, that auger and the fan will dictate the, the heat that is in there. And Mark mentioned a PID controller. That's what the, the Rectech uses, a controller that says how much I need to feed in there to keep a certain temperature. So if I say I want to cook at 225, that Rectech is going to, for hours and hours and hours, keep it within one to two degrees of, of 225. It's going to be near perfection. Mark, what were you showing? I was just showing you my version of the same grill. I'll put it back up again. It's um, this I think was from the very first day I got my grill and I fired it up. Um, if my computer will unfreeze again, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll give you this thing. Keep going, Mike. Well, while he's waiting, while we're waiting on that, I'm going to show you my my one. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. It's still on you. Okay. So here's my here's my gas grill, uh, which I guess will you. You can see that, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. Your your main screen. Okay. So this is this is a Rectech, and um, made by a company called Rectech in Augusta, Georgia. And you can see on the far left, that's the PID controller. That's the controller. That's actually you set the temperature. It tells you the temperature, and then it feeds the pellets in, into there. Um, nice heavy. I think this thing weighs over 200 pounds. Yeah, it looks good. It is heavy duty. Um, steel or, or aluminum or whatever it is. It's stainless steel, I think, is what it is. Um, let's see. If there's a closer-up picture. How do – so does the does the screw also push the ashes out then as well so that you don't no. get ash bound? You're, you're only about 3% ash as yeah. after burning it. And that's the benefit of a pellet. It's the way it burns because it, it's, it's forcing air constantly onto the fire. So it's as if you take little – the fire itself is, is a small little fist-sized fire. But they have, like on the Traeger, they have seven holes around it, and they have a fan constantly pushing air onto it. So when it's running, when it fires up, it sounds like a jet engine. It okay. does. Okay. And and one of the things, you will get some almost like little bitty sawdust at the bottom of your of your grill. I do, at the bottom of a smoker. You just take a shot back every now and then. I haven't actually even done it yet. I've done six or seven smokes in this thing, and I haven't done it yet. So, but you will eventually you want to dust that out, and it's not that much in the fire pit itself. It's usually around it, and get it out. This is the inside of, of my grill, and you can see on the far left hand side is the the thermostat that they have inside there. You see and that? So the heat's coming, indirect heat coming across the bottom, but it's keeping the whole it, it's pull, it's pulling across the smoke and the heat, and exactly. keeping the whole cylinder this uh, a constant temperature. Yeah, there's a heat deflector yeah. in there too. You can you barely really see. see. In this case, I've got a couple of extras on here. I have the frog mats on top, and I have a smoking tube there. They're, they're not part of the, the grill. I added those in as, to take the picture. But underneath, on the far right-hand side, you can see a little bit of silver underneath that, and that is the heat deflector that Mark was just talking about. The, actually, this is the grease, tra the grease um, trap. Underneath that is a heat deflector, and that keeps the direct heat from hitting the, the meat. Um. Mark, so I didn't, uh, I didn't get yours up on the big screen. Can you pop that back? Did it, did you get? Yeah, give me one second. Okay, while you're doing that, Mike, what are you showing us there? This is, in my case, this is the back of the grill, and this is uh, the smoker, I should say, and that's where my pellets go. So I can fit a total of 40 pounds into that, and that's, you know, maybe a little more than half, a little less than half full. You just pour it in there, and depending on the weather, you know, the colder it gets, the more it's going to need to burn. Sure. Sure. But in in the summer months, I can do you know twenty hour smoke and still have you know more, almost half the pellets left after that. Uh, Mark, I'm going to put yours up. Okay. Uh, talk talk to talk to me a little bit about what we're seeing there. Yeah. So th this is a lot smaller version of of Mike's. So this one is the cooking surface is 15 inches by 20 inches. So it's good for a couple of racks of ribs or a uh, a couple of pork shoulders. Um, and they call it a, t a tailgater. You can see from the where the legs bolt onto the body, they're actually quick disconnect legs. So the mm -hmm. legs are designed to fold down so you can bring it to a tailgate party and you can plug it into a, a 120-volt inverter or battery power and run the thing because it, it draws very little current. Um, the principle of the things is that when they first fire up, there's a thing called a hot rod, 
and that gets the pellets lit originally, then they just stay lit with the force of air and wood being dumped into the pellet pot. So that was mine the very first night I got it home, and I'm just firing up my first burn. But it was uh, it was a used unit, so it was. You can see around the openings a little bit of uh, smoke residue. When you when you open that thing up, you get a wonderful campfire smell <laughs> called, from that. It's called flavor. That's what it's that called is. seasoning. Yeah, <laughs> flavor. It's called flavor. Any tech. So in the hoppers or in those kinds of things, any tech as far as temperature? Is it anything connected to your phone so it's letting you know what the temperature is? Or is it still kind of old school? You got to go out and check it. No, I use I use wireless thermometers. So I have uh, the ET, the Maverick ET 732 and 733. Um, they're the newest one is a 300 foot range wireless thermometer. Uh, so I put that out by the grill, and then I can be sleeping overnight. So if I'm doing an overnight cook, I'll I'll uh, I'll be sleeping with it beside me. Or if I go to one of my neighbors to go swimming, I'll take it with me and just put it on the fence, and it picks up the temperature. Um, and it both of the ones I have are are um, dual input thermos, uh, thermocouples. So they have excuse me, they have um, a pit temperature monitor, and they have a uh, meat temperature uh, monitor, so that. Uh, you can watch out, like in an ideal world, the things keep running all night. But it, in reality, every once in a while, you'll have a flame out, or you'll have a fire go out, or a raccoon knocks it over, or something goes off that you, you have to worry about. So the uh, they monitor the pit temp and they monitor the meat temp. With, with two separate probes? Or, yeah. Okay. So one's a metal probe going into the meat, the other is just going into the box. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So one's I have a grill clip, so it actually snaps onto the grills and holds it above the grill, so you gotcha. can keep away from the metal. Yeah. Um, I tend to collect things, so I have two like that now. Um, I, have, I have three, and I have two of them here with me if you want to show me. Yeah, why don't you? I'm, I'm, here, I'm back on you, Mike, if you want to. Right. So this there. this is the, the temperature pro the, the probe you would do for um, the temperature of the, the grill itself. So the, the little clips you can see there. And those, those, those clip onto the grate? Yeah, yep. they, go, they go in between the grate, and then yep. this sits above the grate. Okay. And that would tell you the temperature inside your grill, if, if you needed that. Like, my temperature is fairly accurate. Uh, and then this would be one that you would stick inside of, a, a, you know, inside of something. A carcass. Yeah, Let's and just I call it that. <laughs> I've got a picture. A nine-pound piece of wonderful meat. Yeah. So there's there are two beer can chickens on my on my smoker before I started, and you can see one of them has this that thing I just showed you stuck in one of them. What what are you using, Mike? What brand for your thermometers? I am using uh, the Innovation. So let me go back to me. There's one brand that seemed to make it for everybody else. Yeah, I think that I think it's probably the same version of what what Mark was just saying is just uh, another name or anything. but you have a transmitter this is the one that's actually weather resistant so it can you can stay outside even if it's raining and Mark mentioned it has two two attachments so you can do one on that side and one on this side and it says one's for food and one is for you know grill or whatever it's called um, but you could stick both of them as as the grill or both of them as as meat, whatever one you want, and then you have a receiver, and the receiver then uh, picks it up. And I can, in my, if I have it up on my deck, the transmitter up on my deck, I can put this one at the edge of my office, and it can still get a signal. If I move it in toward my desk, I'll lose signal. So, but that's so, long enough for me. No, no. Well, send it to the phone. So you know, no, oh, this okay. one, no, this one is okay. wireless. So there are okay. some like the iGrill, yeah, which that one is, I think, a Bluetooth one. That's and the one I have. I have the iGrill Mini, which is yeah. uh, retails like, about thirty-five bucks. One one temperature pro, but connects to the phone. Really handy, uh, especially cooking chicken or turkey. Yeah, um, for sure. And the iGrill too, I believe, um, also connects to the phone through Bluetooth and has like a history chart of your temperatures. The the drawback to that is if you lose connection, you lose all your history. So it it yeah. doesn't keep it doesn't keep any of that. It'd be great if it sent it to the cloud and then you could keep it. I thought about that, but this thing does such a great job that I don't do it. And, you know, you, what I also do is you set upper and lower limit uh, temperatures. So, you know, Mark mentioned if you have a flame out, well, if, if my temperature of the grill drops below a certain rate, I get an alarm. Yeah. If once the meat hits a certain temperature, I get an alarm. Yeah. My, my, uh, Mark, what are you showing there? That's another one of my temperature uh, devices. I have an infrared thermometer that I use if I'm doing um, steaks or pizza. I want to see what the temperature of the stone is or the grill. 
So that was the temperature I have put on just before. <laughs> yeah, the mic's got one too. That, that was the temperature when I was doing a, a, doing a check on my grill just before I put some steaks on. Show yours again, Mike. I, I just use, uh, what is this, H, 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 D, E, H, D, E. And you just shoot that at the grill? Yeah, yeah so you want to know. Yeah, you want to know what the temperature of your grill is before you stick something at in there. the, and it's measuring the temperature of the grill at the grate, right? Correct. Is that yeah. okay? Well, it's it's whatever's in front of it. Right. Right. So it but could if, hit the deflector. It could hit. So if I'm if, doing pizza, I actually fire it through my top vent and down onto my stone. Okay. So you put your stone in, and you want to get the you want to get the stone temperature to some some something before you put the pizza on. Is that right? Yeah, 550, 600 degrees. We just got. Do you, do you need a special stone for that? I have. Uh, if I'm doing pizza, I do it in my acorn. Um, it's kind of hard to show what the acorn looks like without a link, because <laughs> this thing is about uh, 100 pounds, but it looks like a big egg. Um, and what I I when I first started, do you guys ever heard of Pampered Chef? Oh yeah. Yep. Okay, so I I put a Pampered Chef $60 stone on my grill, my wife's Pampered Chef stone, <laughs> and I How cooked the go? first pizza. Oh, she was fine with it being on there until I opened up the lid and it cracked. Oh. oh. So yes. after that, I went and bought myself a barbecue pizza stone. So there's a company called Emile Henri, which is in the show notes, that make pizza pizza equipment for the barbecue, like stoneware for the barbecue. So if I'm doing a pizza on my acorn, uh, I fill the fireball up with charcoal. I light a couple of different spots in it. I open up all my vents. Um, I have a temperature pro for my PID controller. It's a high temp version. And then I put a, a pizza stone in. I put a, my cast iron grill in, I put a layer of interlock bricks, and then I put my good pizza stone on top of that, so I have a lot of thermal mass. And what happens when you do that is when you open up the lid to put the barbecue on and you close it back up again, it doesn't take forever to heat back up again because mm -hmm. you have so much heat inside there that it keeps it, it keeps it hot. But those are, you're setting those on top of the grill. I'm Mike putting one underneath it? Yeah. So is this the acorn? Yeah. Uh, Mike's showing. Is that the right one? I've got that yeah. up on the main screen. Okay. That's the acorn. So there's actually a set of tabs on the fireball inside it. So I have a grill that I don't cook on inside that, and I put a, fa uh, a dummy pizza stone on that or an old one, and then the cast iron grill, which is, comes with it, and then the layer, layer of interlock, and then the pizza stone on top of that. So I have I have 20 pounds of ceramic and metal in there to keep the heat in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And brick. It, Could you use brick for that too? Yeah. I, well, I use interlock brick because I have it. Interlock. Okay. So it's it's uh, it, and it, what it does too is it it raises a pizza into the dome so you get more reflective heat to cook the top. That makes so sense. So actually, I'll show you a picture. Um, I'll share my screen here, and this is a picture that I did of a pizza, and that was completely homemade on the grill. Nice. So that's that's complete homemade crust. Uh, that's a margarita pizza with basil inside there, uh, homemade sauce, and that's about eight ten minutes on the grill. And it, you can just see the edges of the of the crust are a little brown, and the top's nice and brown. And the top is perfect. And how long how long did it take you to get to the the grill to the temperature you wanted? About an hour and a half. Yeah, I was gonna say that's a and that's, that's a running lot. that's running full tilt. Yeah. And I've even put my fan in there for my PID controller, having the thing try and go like nonstop, and it still takes an hour and a half. Doesn't matter five, what I do. Five fifty is that what you said? I'm getting this. I'm getting the stone up to around five fifty six hundred. Yeah. But my ash pan is close to twelve hundred. Yikes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's I don't do it very we don't do pizza very often, but when we do it, it's it's a uh, it's a feast. And that's using what's the fuel? Charcoal. Charcoal. Okay. Lump yeah. charcoal. Yeah, that would take a little bit with gas. You could get that a little bit faster, I would imagine. Well, I've um, done everything. Like I've lit uh, full chimneys full of coals and dumped them into the into the um, into the fireball and still had the same issue. Like I've blown fans on it. I've taken a full chimney of coal. I've, I've done a number of different ways trying to get more heat into it quicker, um, and nothing works. Like I'll, I'll show you a chimney here. Like that's that's what a chimney yeah. looks like. Yeah. And that thing is full of red-hot coals and dump that into the fire bowl, and it still takes an hour and a half to get all the cold ceramic, cold steel up yeah. to temperature. No, that makes sense. And I used to I used to burn with a lot of rock on the in the bottom, so I would have a gas burner, and then I would stack probably four or five inches of rock, and I'd yep. layer it over the top. And so there was never any direct flame; it was always coming up through the rocks. Now the disadvantage to that is it takes a long time. And I say a long time; it's first probably a 20-minute heat up time. 
and uh, great when you're cooking turkey because it doesn't that those those stones hold the heat and they distribute it evenly across the bottom, whereas opposed to a direct flame, that's gonna that's gonna create some really weird hot spots on the. Now I've I've since backed off. I tried. I threw some of those away when I when I did uh, most recently did um, when I most recently changed out my burner and I threw some away. And I have not liked that experience. And I think the next time I'll go back to a thicker stone, you know, a layered stone bottom that sits over. Now the disadvantage to that is that it burns my burners out very very quickly because there's that and creates this intense heat around the burners. And of mm-hmm. course. So that's getting <laughs> that's getting pretty warm, and I, I, I at, believe it or not, though, even in those conditions, I got a cast iron burner to last for seven years. Wow, and, that's good. Yeah, I mean, usually, yeah, cast iron is the way to go. Okay, hold on, Mark's throwing something else up there. What do we well, got? That, that's, I just realized that's my that's my layout for my interlock brick. So I took a picture of it so I can remember how to put them together. But you can see that the interlock bricks, and then the cast iron beneath that, and then beneath yeah. that, there's a ceramic disc again. Yeah. And then my piece of stone was on top of that. You're kind of doing what I'm doing, just on the top. Yeah. You know, you've got that on, and then your stones on. Your uh, does the stone go directly on the on the bricks? Yeah. Okay. But that's only for pizza. That's the only time I use that is for pizza. Uh, let me and let me tell people this again. This is probably a good one to come to the YouTube for if you're watching the audio of it. We do have available for you a video large and a video small RSS feed. If you don't want to go to YouTube and get it done, or you're some spot where you can't get YouTube. I do have. If you go to theaverageguy.tv and then you go to the subscribe tab, we do have RSS available for you. Uh, there, if you want to download those for these, Mike. Uh, let's go. That's really cool. Thanks for bringing that picture out, Mark. Uh, what else? I know you've got, you've always got stuff on your desk. I got, I got several more things to go through. So, before we leave the temperature gauge stuff, you know, we talked about, we we showed the instant read here, where you're checking the, before you put the food on the grill, right? Uh, Mark and I both had one. Then we talked about how we monitor the temperature of the grill, monitor the temperature of the food. And then I've got this for before I take it off. And this is, uh, in this case, it's a Javelin Pro, I think is the name of it. Um, and it's an instant read thermometer. So, you know, once you, once you pull out the little needle, it turns on. And then you stick it into the meat at different areas. And you, um, I forgot to bring one. The what, one you're you're not supposed down. to guess? <laughs> well, I mean, you can. You know, this is one of the things where maybe I'm not a true pit master because I, I don't look at it and say, "Looks done." Um, That's the remember the Ryan when Ryan was on. You know, he says yeah. one finger, two finger, three. Anyways, keep going. Yeah, but I don't have to be that kind of a genius. I just stick this in and say, "Yep, right temperature or wrong temperature, or whatever else." I stick that in there and it's good to go. Um, there's one thing maybe as we're talking about marks, I'll look, look for mine. Where you know different meats re- require a different temperature and and different temperature where they're safe to eat and different temperatures where you want it to eat, uh, and I have a little chart that I bought that has all that in there, a little dummy, uh, you know, thing for dummies. But this is how I checked to see before I take it off the grill. And and the good ones are those relax react within one second. Yeah, this but one act, reacts really fast. You can get different t- different quality by paying different amounts of money. So that's one of them. I have one called a, th- a Therma Pen. Yeah. And I think I paid a hundred dollars for it. Yikes. So, but that's what, that's another good. temperature, well, yeah, but I use it all the time. Yeah, right. Like everything from cooking breakfast sausages to cooking chicken, just throw a thing into it because the best way to eat meat is when it's just cooked. So you don't yeah, want it to be dried out and too cooked. And um, I just what threw are you up, showing? so this is one of, we talked about a PID controller, and I'm sure some of the guys will know what a PID controller is, but basically it's a way of controlling the temperature in your grill. So the, the pellet grills have that built into it. You just dial the temperature and you go. But my charcoal grills, uh, all of my charcoal grills need some way of controlling the temperature automatically if I'm going to cook over uh, overnight. So the blower sits in the bottom vent. You adjust the temperature you want on the display. So I say I want to keep it at 250. And there's a thermocouple that sits on the grill, and it keeps it at 250 all night just by controlling the air. Wow. So it awesome. makes it into an oven, like an overnight oven. Well, until you run out of coal, right? Well, the my acorn will run up to 30 hours on one load of coal. Wow, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah. So doing a 14-hour cook, like for a pork shoulder, not a problem at all. Okay. And in the acorn, so is the charcoal's at the bottom? Is it a traditional where it's at the bottom center area? Yeah, so it's, it's shaped like an egg. So yeah. Um, I actually run a basket inside it that fits into it. Um, if I'm doing like a four or six-hour cook, I just fill the basket up. Uh, last weekend I did one for 10 hours and I just went through a basket of coal. Um, if I'm doing an overnight cook like this or doing pizza, I take the basket out and I just fill the, the bowl up itself. 
the basket's nice because when you're done with it, you can just shake the basket and all the ash falls off. And that's because the egg shape is efficient, right? Is that the... Is well, that it, the it's double insulated. So it's two layers of metal with insulation between it. And it's ceramic? No, it's metal. Metal, okay. Which means it's 100 pounds for it versus an egg that's three or 400 pounds. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So um, there, isn't, there isn't anything I can't do on my on my $400 Canadian egg. You guys can get them for $299, 250 um, that you can do on a on a thousand dollar ceramic egg. It, it's um, there's a lot of of uh, discussion about well it's going to rust out. Well I've had mine three years. I've gone through 70 pounds of charcoal this year, um, and I would have gone through more if I didn't have my Traeger. I've gone through 50 pounds of pellets since I have my Traeger. <laughs> how much? Uh, let's uh, with pellets. You 50 pounds. Uh, yeah. How much is it a pound? I mean, do you buy it by the pound, or how does it? How uh, does that 20 work? pound bags right now. I'm paying 14 dollars for. Yeah. But guys in the States are getting them down at 7 bucks for, for a 20-pound bag of Lumberjack, which is a good brand. So 50 Lumber cents to a dollar a pound. Yeah. Lumberjack is a good pound. And depending on your temperature of where you're at, it's going to depend upon how much you use. Uh, yeah. And brand, different brands will burn at different rates. For me, you know, I did recently uh, what should have been a 3-2-1 rib thing. And I'll come back to – we'll come back to some recipes here in a minute. But it turned out to be a little more like a 3-2-3. Three, three. Um <laughs> And that's and what that, does so that mean? I don't know what that means. Three hours, two hours, three hours, and, oh, I and get into that. So you know, what's that? Uh, uh, eight hours, and even at that, it wasn't where I would need to be. But in that in that time frame, I probably used you know, I don't know. I'm guessing here, maybe ten pounds or less of, of pellets. So and, the, you know, and depending on the grill size too, you use more too. Yeah. So Michael use his grill is significantly larger than my grill. He'll use a lot more than I would. Yeah, you saw that earlier picture where I had two chicken, two full chickens on there, and still had a lot of room. And that awesome. that grill can hold a lot. I do yeah. want to show you one one more have thing. Have you filled you know. that up yet, Mike? Go ahead. While you're looking that up, have you filled that grill up yet? Not completely full, and I do have a second rack where I can add even more to it. But I've had two things of ribs, uh, spare ribs, and two full chickens on it, and still had extra room. So for me, I bought this, and I know you can probably just copy it off of Amazon and cheat. But you know, I gave the guy six bucks, whatever it was, and bought it. And it's a magnet. You buy it as a magnet, and I have it, um, you know, on the grill. And basically saying, here's the meat types. Here's the, the temperature you should smoke them at, the recommended temperature. And you can play with this and do your own thing. Here's the internal temperature you're shooting for, and here's the temperature that the uh, USDA says safe. So like for a brisket, the USDA said take it off at 145 deg uh, degrees. You really need to get that thing around 200 degrees or so. I think 203 is supposed to be like the magic number for a brisket. And then down at the bottom, it's telling you the different types of wood and what they're good what they're good for. You know, what, for a, a beef, which would be a brisket, you know, hickory is really good for that. And so is oak, and so is uh, pecan. Yeah, I, I'm gonna have to get me one of those. Yeah, it's it's real neat to have to have because I you know over time I'm sure I'll remember this. But it's nice to have as a as a crutch as I'm getting more into this. What are you so, What are you showing there, Mark? So just putting in perspective, like Mike, can how many ribs are, can you put on at once, Mike, on your grill? I've only put two, but I also had two full chickens on at the same time. So that's my acorn, and that's about if I use a rib rack, I could stand them up and maybe put another rack or rack and a half on. But you really don't want to get further, much more further to the edge than the edge of that silver pan at the bottom, which is a drip pan, because that that makes it uh, indirect heat. So most of my grills, I can cook maybe two, maybe three racks comfortably on them. For Mike's grill, he can cook easily three or four racks plus a couple of chickens on it. Yeah. So just just size ratio is is. Uh, I'm doing lots of small grills. Mike's got a couple of big grills. <laughs> well, and what do you do? You know, uh, Mark, you said it's you and it's you and your wife, and uh, you're cooking all this food. Do your neighbors just love you, or how how does that you, you cook it all in one shot and then you know eat it over time? How does that work? Because that's a lot of it's a well, lot of meat. This weekend we did a thing called pepper stout beef, which is my number one requested meal by my friends. Every single friend, this friend if I tell them I'm making beef this weekend, like can we have some? Um, I have people asking for it from two hours away saying, if you're ever coming down and you have some of that, we'll, we'll take it off your hands. Um, <laughs> I have a friend who owns a canteen, uh, like a, um, what do you call it? Like a, it's a chip wagon she went to events with called the Cadillac Canteen. She wanted to buy it for her canteen to sell. And I said, yeah. I can't, it's too expensive to make it. I can't sell it to you and let you sell it. But I give her a pound every time I make it. 
and she's a gourmet cook, and she drools every time she has it. <laughs> so this weekend we did nine pounds of this pepper stout beef, a nine pound roast, and then you put it with um, uh, onions, mushrooms, uh, jalapenos, garlic, uh, can of stout, and Worcester sauce. And I have a picture of it if I can find it. Wait a minute, um, a can of stout. A can of stout beer. What's that? Beer. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Um, I don't believe I didn't. Um, okay, I did do it. And uh, so you cook it for four hours on the grill until it hits. And everything on the grill that we do is, is temperature-based. So you cook it until a certain temperature. So you cook it until it's 165 internal temperature and smoke, so around 250 degrees, and it's just covered in salt and pepper. And then you put it on a bed of vegetables with the beer and the, and the Worcester sauce, and you foil it, and you cook it on the grill again until it hits 215 degrees Fahrenheit, Ooh. which you'd think would be just like shoe leather. And what happens is all the juices come out of the meat. They fall into that. You make this, this big medley of, of meat, and then I pull it with my meat rakes, and it makes this meat mash that is um, – I'm salivated. I'm talking about it. <laughs> it it's the, num the number one thing I have that's been requested to do it. Um, and so what we do is we make it for ourselves and then we share it. Yeah. So I'll bring a pound in and we'll put it in the freezer. It freezes really, really well. Um, we'll put it in shepherd's pie. We'll put it in chilies and spaghettis. And, yeah. and you, could, uh, you could refreeze it again or refrigerate it, right? Yeah. So we, we eat it typically. Uh, then we put it up. Uh, we eat it for three or four days and we put it in the freezer in three quarter pound bags. And then we eat it until it's gone. And it's some like I had a guy over the other day. One of my neighbors was was helping me fix my uh, dishwasher, and I said, uh, he said, what I, I said, what do you, I, what do I owe you? And he says nothing. So I gave him a bag of this stuff. And he's like, oh, fantastic. <laughs> so, get paid in beef. That's beef, right? Beef. So we, I do like I like I like sharing my stuff as much as I like cooking. We have some stuff that we cook for ourselves, and we have a lot of stuff that we'll cook for other people. So we try and have people over, I don't know, a dozen times a year for barbecue. And at the end of the summer, I do. Uh, I got complaints last year because I was posting on my barbecue, and I had friends that hadn't been over for any. So mid-September last year, I had this massive party that we had 15 people over, and I cooked. That was the one where I cooked for a seven-pound pork shoulder, 24 jalapeno poppers, 10 onion bombs, six mini quesadillas, 24 drumsticks, and then everybody else brought the sides, and, and it was a feast. And, and Mark mentioned uh, the temperature there, the 215 degrees. One of the things that, that's so good about smoking versus grilling is that low and slow, that you know, keeping the meat, getting the meat above 160, 170 degrees, each meat's a little different, um, for hours just tears apart, just breaks down all those rough things inside of, a, of the meat. Like a brisket is just marbled with fat inside of it and all kind of other hard stuff. And as you cook it for hours at those higher temperatures, it just breaks all that down into moistness um, and, and makes it so good. Mark, you're showing, I assume you're showing a, uh, a, a done pork um, shoulder. Pork shoulder. Yeah, so you can see the, Mike was talking about the doneness. You can see I dug into it a little bit just with forks. You stick a fork into it, and they call it probe tender when the fork goes right through it and there's no resistance. Yep. It's the, the only tool you use to pull it apart. Oh, the, the pit masters use rubber gloves, but um, I use these things called meat rakes, and they look like small versions of rakes. And Mike has another pair called uh, bear paws, I think they are. And, I got them right here. And they literally, they, that's all we need to pull the meat apart, and it just destroys itself. Mike, you, is that in the kitchen that you use those, or are you using them right on the grill, or how's in that? In the kitchen. Not? Yeah, in the kitchen. Once you bring it inside, so it's it's yeah. you know they're pretty sharp there, and it's hard plastic in this case. Yeah. And you're just using it to to pull apart the meat. You know, you you do a a, a pork butt or something like that, and you get the pulled pork. You know, this is what you're using because you're doing it while the meat's still pretty hot. So you're gonna have to wear something. Yeah. Do you in in conventional grilling, uh, like if I'm doing a steak or a burger, I let that sit for you know a few minutes to kind of rest. Same same idea in smoking. Do you need to let that meat rest and let some of those things come back into it? I, I, I do. If I, yeah, if I'm doing a pork shoulder, um, I put it into a pre-warm cooler. When it hits 203 degrees, I heat up a cooler with hot water. And then at 205, I pull it off and I wrap it in two layers of foil, then two layers of blankets or towels, and I leave my thermometer in it. And then I put it in this warm cooler for up to – my record, I think, was seven hours. And I drove in minus 20 degrees Celsius weather for two hours with it in the cooler in the trunk. And we had it for lunch, and it was still 165 when we pulled it out. 
Yeah, and, and what that does for you, so a couple things. One, with a lot of these meats, you do want them to sit a little bit after they get off the grill so that all that juiciness gets back into the meat and, and uh, becomes juicy again. But the other thing is, is by being able to do what Mark just did, by putting it in the, you know, wrapping it, putting it in some kind of, um, you know, blanket or something like that or a towel and then putting it into a, a cooler, you don't have to put it in a cooler, but by if you put it in a cooler, that all that does is just make the, the – you know, it takes longer, it keeps it warm longer. So let's say you get done at 2, you know, crap, I'm done at 2, but dinner's not till 6. Well, you put it in that thing, keep it warm that way, and it's ready by 6. So, you, you, you know, some of these time, these things, like a, let's say a brisket, you may be cooking an hour to an hour and a half per pound. So if you're cooking a 15-pound brisket, you may be thinking, all right, this is a 20-hour cook. But I need to leave myself a little bit of a, a buffer there, so maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna try and get it done. You know, I'm gonna count on a 22-hour cook. But then you get done at 18 hours. There's, there's a saying in barbecue, and the, it's the, the meat's done when the meat's done. Yeah. You can't you rush get, it. It's gonna be ready when it's ready. You get done at 18 hours. You go. Well, what do I do now? Well, you do what Mark just did, and now it'll still be good four, five, six hours later, even more. Uh, there is something along the way with, uh, and this is usually with the bigger meats, but it can happen with ribs too. It's somewhere in the 140 to 170 range, um, maybe 160 is the, the, the mean there. You're going to hit what they call the stall. <laughs> that's, a, that's a panic for the people who haven't done it before. Yes, even I still panic. It's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crank up the heat. i got to get going. You know, you're sitting there for an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever it is, and your, your meat's not moving at all. It's just sitting there, not going anywhere, and you're going, what am I doing wrong? Is the thing broken? And what I, I just read something uh, recently that was what's happening is that's where some steam is being released from the meat, and that is causing the temperature to kind of hold there for a while, and you just got to you just got to get past that. So you get past that uh, temperature, and then eventually it'll start cranking back up again. It's called, I think they call it change of state, yeah. and it's one of the hardest things to deal with. Jim, you mentioned steaks. That's my steak on my charcoal grill. Mm. Yes. Let me show you this photo. So we're and getting people hungry. That's a uh, six-minute steak. That's an inch and a half thick strip loin done in six minutes. That's one of the few ribs left at that stage. <laughs> so, uh, um, oh, that looks so good. Um, <laughs> it was really, really good. <laughs> Mark, you said okay. So that uh, sure the steaks. You said you cooked that in six and a half minutes. Yeah, but it's 900 degrees. Right. Oh, oh yeah. Right. So I, I set my pebble up with an auto-repeating timer on it for like a minute and 15 seconds, and I do four, uh, four cycles on direct heat and then two cycles on indirect heat. Okay. And it's uh, – but that's that's what – I've been asked before, like if I had to get rid of all my grills and keep one, what would I do? And I always go back to the same thing. It would be I would keep my acorn because the acorn out of all of them is my most versatile – I can set it up for a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, like I've even done – uh, Throw up a picture know? there or come back onto your. Um... Yeah, I'm looking at my banana bread. I did banana bread in it. What? Yeah, there's my banana bread. <laughs> well, it's just heat, right? It's an oven. That's it's a little oven. odd, isn't it? No, the, if you go on these on these cooking forums, and I'm sure Mike's running for the same thing, you get onto them, and the amount of ideas people have. Or you get onto a Traeger forum or a Rectech forum, and it's like, oh, here's a recipe, let's Traegerize it. Or here's a recipe, let's let's do this. So last night we had smoked corn, and it was just corn on the cob Ooh. on the grill yeah. in smoke. Yeah. yeah. Um, nothing that else. would be delicious. That we've done we've done a little bit of that. I don't. I need to do it. We we do it on our open pit, and I always I always get out there too late, and yeah. I always have to crank the heat up, and then you end up scorching it, and it's not great. Yeah, the one thing I have found is to give myself more time because I do the same thing, Jim. I, I'm thinking, all right, dinner's at six. This is going to take this much time to cook, and I'm going to try and get on the grill by get it on the grill by noon. And it turns out one o'clock. And so, what I got to start doing is, no, I'm going to get it on the grill by if I'm smoking, I'm going to get it on the grill by ten uh, for a normal like chicken or for ribs or something like that. For some of the others, it take even longer. Speaking of chicken, you know, I showed earlier a beer can chicken. They had two chickens on the on the grill. Do you remember that photo? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Have you done beer can chicken before? Uh, I have, yes. Okay. So, I'll have, you done, let me... have you done brine chicken before? I was going to talk uh, about that too. Yeah. So, well, keep going, Mike. But um, no, but um, Ryan uh, Ryan Parker has tried to talk me into that a couple times. Okay. So here are two here are two chickens on my grill, beer can chickens, and I'm when you talk about beer can, you can use beer, 
or you can use any other liquid that you want. Um, so let me go back to me uh, there. So here's the old beer can chicken holder I was using. You just stick the can, whatever you know, aluminum can right here, and then stick the 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 chicken or turkey or whatever you're doing with its butt right through that. And you know, you pour out a little bit of the little bit of the the, the liquid that's in there. I use I've used Dr Pepper, I've used apple juice, I've used all kind of things. The one thing that got me a little concerned one of the last times I did it, and I, I ended up reading somewhere, was when I pulled the chicken off, some of the ink that was on the can was no longer there. Yeah, um, I don't do those anymore. Yeah, so what I have done since then is I have bought, um, I think I have this in your show notes, Jim. This is a little tray that has a little holder that then has a little can, and it's all stainless steel. And the can has a top on it, so you can put whatever liquid you want in there, and it has holes in the top. So you can you know, take this out and put it all in the um, dishwasher, but you just pour whatever liquid you want inside of the can, and then uh, it acts as a beer can chicken with no, no ink or anything on it, to, so it should be more healthy. Well, don't you think the ink is just coming off on the inside of the bird and you're not going to eat that? Or it, it wouldn't vaporize, certainly, would it? Well, the, the problem wanna... is we, you don't know what chemicals they treated the outside of the can with or what cleansing solutions or any of that stuff. True. True. So this way you're pulling a clean can out of your dishwasher or out of your sink and you're putting it in with stuff that you know is clean. Yeah. We're talking about making people hungry. I'm going to show one more picture that is another one of my uh, <laughs> requested uh, – crap. One of my requested pictures. These are what's called the atomic buffalo turds. Oh, yeah. Those are awesome. And um, – Look awesome, I should say. They disappear pretty fast. Yeah. So that's uh, – it's jalapenos that are cut in half and cored out. And then you stuff them with a mixture of cream cheese, cheddar cheese, spices, and some sausage. And then you wrap them in bacon and you put them on the grill for an hour. We should grill at the meetup. <laughs> <laughs> can you bring a grill, Mark? No, <laughs> he can I'm bring his, his Traeger. I'm flying, not driving. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, your Traeger is, uh, is, is travel ready, but uh, you're flying down. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's now talk about brining. You talk about brining. So here's my injection kit. Jimmy's. Yeah, I, I have full screen. We're good. So you got a little injection kit, which has you know the 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 cylinder thing, and then it has needles. And so, so okay, I'm, t I'm mixing things up. This is not the brining. This is the injection. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> brining is actually I I ha just did it for the first time um, a few weeks ago, and it turned out much easier than I thought, Jim. Okay. So I have a ice chest that's one of those ones that has a plastic insert with uh, almost like a cloth um, thing around it that's insulated. That plastic insert pops out and it is perfect size for putting two chickens in there, two full chickens or one big turkey and filling it with brine solution. And I have some old uh, jugs, water gallon jugs that had either water in it or I think they might have had lemon juice, something like that, that I've cleaned out. And that's where I store my brine solution. And keep that refrigerated. So then it's so easy, to, you know, the night before or a few hours before, whatever. You don't want to go too long because if you keep it brining for too long, it get too salty. You put that chicken in there. You pour those things on top of it, the, those the stuff on top of it, so it covers the chicken, and then you just let it sit. And I've used just a simple mixture, but you can, you know, this is where again where you can get your own creativeness going, of just uh, kosher salt and brown sugar. That, you that's can, a popular one. Yeah, but you can add other things in there that you want to. And then just brine it, and it does make it more juicy. What I've done is a very similar thing, but I used a one-gallon Ziploc bag, which holds one chicken. Yep, I've done the same thing. Yeah. Actually, this past time, because I just figured out that plastic container, I had the one-gallon uh, bag in the plastic container. <laughs> yeah, so you I put the ch chicken in the plastic container, put the brine, the brine in the container, yeah. zip it up, and then put it inside the... The, or you can, if you have it, you gotta make sure the plastic is food grade, which the one gallon plastic, the plastic bag would be. Right. Um, in this case, the ice chest was also. So you could, you could skip the plastic bag if you have something like that, and just stick the chicken in there, put the brine in there, and then the key is, I put that back in the refrigerator because you gotta keep it cold. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I put my one gallon bag chickens in, uh, in a pot, and then put them in the fridge so nothing punctures the bag. But the other secret about when you're doing brining is you have to wash it off afterwards really well. Really good. Because yeah. there's so much salt in the water that you got to make sure you wash it all off. And any, then, any, te 
any tech associated with the brine process, or is it just old school, pour it in, put it in the fridge, and you're good to go? Just old school. There's nothing. Okay. A lot of the barbecue stuff, like we talk about a lot of technology and the stuff, but a lot of it is, I, I, I laughed the other day. I said one of the things I love about barbecue is I get to light fires. <laughs> <laughs> get back to your base roots of now, I, the, I'm a caveman. The one time you don't want to brine is if you're going to be frying like a turkey. Right. You're going to fry the turkey. You know, don't, don't brine it then. You might and and the, the, other, the other secret of brining is that you have to trust your thermometers when it comes out because you'll be carving this thing and you'll see so much juice coming out of it that you're like, this can't be right. <laughs> and when I first did it, I actually had to probe it again and like, this is over, this is 165. This is, this is fine to eat, but it was so juicy that it just didn't make sense. Yeah, we we had I ran into the same problem when you know we wrap it in bacon, the turkey, mm -hmm. and I then I put it inside a tinfoil envelope system that uh, is triple wrapped, and then we add Italian oil, you know, Italian dressing to it, like cheesy Italian dressing and some other stuff, and that cooks up so moist, and the uh, the envelope creates such a constant temperature around it. By the time we pull it out, and I have that probe that goes in, so it tells me what 170 or what 175, whatever it is. And I pulled that thing out, and I remember the first time cutting it exactly. I was like, oh, I, this doesn't – like, this is so juicy. I don't think this is done. And, well, uh, that, which, you know. that and the fact on, on the acorn, if I'm cooking the acorn at, like, 350, the vents are maybe an eighth of an inch open. Like, you think about your traditional bar gas barbecue, you have a vent in the back that's about two inches high by the length of the barbecue. Where these acorns in that top vent, you barely have the thing cracked open to get uh, a decent temperature. So all this moisture, if you're cooking like frozen chicken breasts, you lift the lid and you're getting a, a waft of steam coming out your glasses. Mm -hmm. it, it keeps so much moisture into it. The 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 Traegers and the pellet grills are, are similar in an offset, so they have lots of big openings. The uh, the acorns and the Komodos have gaskets on them, so you're really controlling how much air goes into them. Yeah. And that's the downside of smoking on them is that there's not a whole lot of air getting pushed into them to allow the smoke to get generated because yeah. they're too efficient at burning. And, and if you are smoking, you, you do need to go at a lower temperature, like the the my rec tech. If I'm if I'm smoking, if I'm cooking at three four hundred degrees, I'm not getting a lot of smoke, and that's really not the sweet spot for the rec tech. You know, when I'm down at two twenty five, two fifty, I can get some decent smoke. Um, now, Jim, I got a question for you. Yeah. Have you ever grilled or smoked and something stuck to the grill? Um, I mean, in the old days, yes. I, I had not so much anymore because I seasoned my grill really well, but but um, yeah, for sure. What do you got for me? I've got, and I think Mark has these too. I have these things called frog mats. Are you, do you have these, Matt? Um, yeah, Matt. Yep. Yeah, frog mat my, uh, for my um, Traeger. And you know, I, I put them on the grill or the smoker when I'm going to either cook something that's going to be too small, don't want it falling through the the grill. Or if uh, something that may be a little sticky, like I was doing um, pig candy the other day, and it, it has a lot of sugar in it, and I was afraid it's going to be sticky and stick to the to the grill. So you put it on this, and it, this stuff, I have not found anything that will stick to this. Hmm. This thing, and it, it cleans up amazingly quick it's and easy. It's called a what? Frog mat. Frog mat? Frog mat? Yeah. Okay. All one word. And how uh, are they fairly expensive? You get them on no. Amazon. No, I see. 20, gonna... twenty bucks for the fifteen by twenty. Have Have either one of you guys used cast iron uh, like um, uh, pans or have cooked sauces or anything? I on do a smoked chili. I actually I won the I won a chili contest last year. We host a we host a chili contest every year in our house. So we have ten cooks come over with chilies. We have 40 people come in. We have a massive 400 spot spreadsheet that uh, we tap out all the results. You are just like Howard. Jeez. <laughs> we, we've raised. We brought spreadsheets into the barbecue talk. This is awesome. <laughs> we've raised $1,800 in the last three years for local dog rescues that are all volunteer based. Oh, that's awesome. Um, just when I thought we couldn't bring spreadsheets up. <laughs> last year or last three years, I've done it. I've smoked my chili. So oh last, wow. So last year I did a. I I came in. Third the first year, fifth the second year, and first last year. And uh, last year I went and bought a ribeye and I smoked the ribeye, and then I cut it up into little quarter pieces and put it into the chili. And then I took um, coarse ground beef from a butcher and smoked that as meatballs, and then chopped that up. And then I smoked the chili itself on the grill for four hours. So it was a really smoky. Oh, wow. Was it in a cast iron pan, or how did you? What did you put it in? 
Yeah, it's in a cast iron pot that's uh, acry uh, not acrylic. Um, what do they call it? It's it's uh, ceramic coated, but a cast iron ceramic coated pot. Okay. But I also have there's a lot of guys that do a lot of cooking on uh, in cast iron on the grill for sauces, for yeah. uh, fajitas, for all sorts of stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, mine. That's uh, I bought this pot just for the grill, so it's got a nice patina of smoke on it um, that never seemed to get perfectly clean. But it's it's my go-to pot for the chili. Yeah, uh, Mike, you were showing that frog mat. Yeah, on, let me go back to that. On. So in this case, this one's called. This is from Rectech, who's my grill guys. Um, my and and theirs is like eight dollars and twenty-five cents for a sixteen by sixteen inch. The one I had that I just showed you. So it, it, they're very cheap. Um, I don't. I don't know how long they'll last, but I'll buy, I'll rebuy them whenever these go out. Yeah, I mean that's they're, just they're fantastic. I, I use mine for uh, candy bacon too. Yeah, you could do veg vegetables on them. I would assume. Absolutely, yeah. great great way to. And they're to quarter do. inch. They're quarter inch holes, so they stop any of the stuff that would normally fall through. Mm -hmm. I would think like a tomatoes or peppers. Absolutely, yeah. Would be, yeah. Would be dynamite. And and I like I said, I did pig candy on it, which is bacon with brown sugar and in my case maple syrup, and it did not stick to it. They came right off, like it wasn't mm -hmm. even there. Delicious. Yeah, I did. I did bacon wrapped pork tenderloin with a, a take, um, pepper jelly glaze, and they didn't stick to it at all. <laughs> and so I have a few more items to go over, but then we, then I think we, if you don't have time, Jim, yeah, I wouldn't just... mind. I wouldn't mind talking about some specific foods. Sure, let's keep going. Mark's already done a great job of showing us some, but you know, uh, Mark and I were talking before the show. Let me pull this up. So this is this is me doing a uh, hamburgers on my grill, not on a smoker. And to the left side, you see uh, something emitting smoke. And add, right, I have a little tube there. A little tube, and it's got pellet, wood pellets inside of it. This is the 12-inch smoke tube from uh, was it Amazing or something like that? Amazing smoke tube. And the 12-inch will provide about four hours of smoke. Now, doing burgers, the reality is you're not having them on the grill that long, so they're not going to absorb that much smoke, but I still did it anyway. Um, and so you can use that in your smoker where maybe a pellet smoker is not giving you enough smoke. It, it is enough for me, but some people say it's not enough. You can put that in your smoker and give yourself even more smoke. You can put it in your grill and give you some smoke there. But I also have in this scene something else that the burgers are sitting on top of, and that is grill grates, and they're uh, anodized aluminum. And these are fairly new, so they look really clean, but they eventually get much darker and much more seasoned and become anti-stick all by themselves. And it, it does heat up like it'll it'll be hotter on these things than it was on the grill, um, so it'll be a little bit hotter there. Plus, it, it almost prevents all uh, flare-ups from yeah. the burgers. And the juices fall into the little trays, the little grooves, and add more moisture. So... Actually, now when I if I'm doing the steaks, <clears throat> if I'm doing burgers, I'm using these grill grates. Mm. And you wow. mentioned flare-ups just now. That's one of the we made some homemade burgers one time. And when you control the amount of oxygen in a grill, which you can do on on the acorns and the and the Weber's, um, you can have all this grease hitting these hot coals and no flame. And then when you open the lid up, then you get these massive flames that are a foot high. And you close the lid back <laughs> up again. All the flame goes out, so it's the same idea with this, and that, that's one of the things I love about charcoal is it's really hard to get the, the burnt food. Yeah, that's true. I, I imagine these would work well on charcoal. That Mike, the I mean, yeah. it'd be great for gas, but where charcoal you might get uneven cooking surfaces, this might be a you could throw that on the heat side, and uh, in that that surface would heat up pretty evenly and keep the fires down. You know, with charcoal yeah. you're not always. I mean, for a lot of us, we're not. We don't have that controlled surface mark, and so we're, we may be getting those flare-ups, and uh, or we can't control the oxygen. So I have to try one of those. I bet I can. Go, you, I assume you pick those up on Amazon as well. Yeah, just do a search for grill grates. Okay. Uh, those grill grates I actually got from from Rectech, but you can get them on Amazon. Yeah, it also comes with um, a little spatula, oh, and this spatula, this this thing here, you know, it fits inside the grooves which is really nice. You can get under your burger, whatever you're cooking, and just flip it over really easy. And it also, as you can see, is let's see if I can get it at the right angle. The top of it is kind of curved, so you stick it into the grates, and it cleans it up really nice. So it's both a tool for flipping your food, and it's also a tool for cleaning the grates. Do you leave the grates seasoned, or do you clean those after each? You just want to do a light cleaning. You want to get the, the, the you know, the deposits or whatever on there, yeah. yeah. Mark, Ooh, what, are you, what are you showing, Mark? Have you ever heard of um, 
a fatty, as it's called. No. So that's a meatloaf that's rolled with stuff inside it and then wrapped with a bacon weave. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually weave your bacon together like a quilt, and then you layer on top of the meat. And that one was stuffed with spinach and cheese and onions and bacon. And that's when I first started cooking it. And that's what it looks like when it comes out. Yeah, look at that. Something wrong with the word bacon. Not wrong. Something terribly right with the word bacon weave. Oh, there's there's something called meat glue that I haven't <laughs> used yet, but it helps dissolve some of the fatty tissue, and it actually makes it so that when you make a weave and you sprinkle it with this meat glue, you can actually pick the thing up and it doesn't fall apart. <laughs> nice. Yeah, kind of holds the uh, bacon together. Yeah. Matt, have you heard of uh, swine apple, where you're taking um, uh, pig loin, um, pork, pork loin, uh, pineapple that you've hollowed out, and then doing a bas uh, bacon weave like you just did to put that around it? And cooking all that on the smoker. Oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> you take a pineapple, you core it out, so core it out. You just have the rind. Yeah. You put the and pork. You put, loin. No, 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 no. You leave some meat. You leave some pineapple meat in it. A little bit, yeah. yeah. A little bit. And then you jam the pork loin inside that. Yeah. You may want to the... cut it into strips or something. Okay. But you put you put it in there, yeah. Right. Then and you then put the top back on and use long toothpicks or spears to you know keep it on there. Then you do a bacon weave around the pineapple, and you put that in the smoker. Does the bacon make it through the pineapple into into the pork loin? It well, does. No, no. All kind of the juice is kind of coming together a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's something I want to try. That's on one of my bucket list to try. So we've we bought a, um, and I don't know if it's a Pampered Chef, but it uh, we have this pineapple core that is yeah. just a champion, and it's just two pieces. You know, you got a you got a piece about this big and a and a shaft that goes down the middle, and you. Cut the, the cut the ends off and set it on the top and then put this thing in and snap it and then just twist it and it goes down right awesome. and then the core comes up through the center and my God that has made the, that has made pineapple like revolutionary for us we, we're eating fresh pineapple and lately Baker's our supermarket's been running at 99 cents a pineapple and so it's super cheap right to, to, and really good pineapples but I never thought about taking pork loin jamming that in the center of that thing because we always put we always cut the bait of the the pineapple up and set it on top of the meat and then yeah. I, you know we cook it with it sitting on top but wow <laughs> yeah the, the problem with your tool though jim i think it makes a spiral out of the pineapple right it does make a spiral yeah so you want to keep this you want to keep this pineapple intact yeah and then the one i saw was they they seasoned all the pork loin with magic dust or some sort of Barbecue. Yeah. It it keeps the rind intact. It only yeah. it only spirals the pi the pineapple inside you know, the inside. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't spiral the outside. So it's still intact. We get a cylinder of pineapple rind. <laughs> and then Mike, but you're saying put bacon around that. Yeah. Then cook that whole thing. Yeah. yeah. What's that called? Swine apple. Swine apple. Yeah. Oh man, I'm in. <laughs> There's so many. It's it's hard. Like I'm on I'm on a couple of different news groups and I'm on uh, a couple of different RSS feeds for it. And one I use all the time is called Barbecue Brethren. And the amount of guys, like what Mike and I are talking about, we're peons compared to a lot oh, of the guys yes. that run these things. It's crazy how adventurous, how creative some of these guys are. Uh, would, Barbecue I, Brethren has a throwdown every week of different contests. I would tell you that when I first started getting into this, I bought Kindle books. I bought real books. All these things I was reading up on, okay, what do I need to do? But what really helped me out the most was either uh, like the RecTech forum on Facebook or there's tons of YouTube channels with, a, you know, just incredible number of views and all this stuff. And you find a personality that fits with yours, you know, uh, smoking with uh, Jeff, um, I, I can't remember. There's a, I have probably like a half dozen or more of these that I watch, and everybody has their own little way of doing it, and at first it's a little frustrating because you think, why isn't there just one way? What is the one way? But then you realize there is no one way, and uh, all these guys have their own little twist, and you find your own little twist by watching all these different things, uh, and and you know you, you try new things. and So I watched those things, and I was, I, when I was cooking those ribs, and it was taking so long, and I was wondering what's going on, I went and watched somebody else and said, here, try this and see. This is the way you can tell if it's done. And I did that. And, oh, my ribs are done. I'm going to be done. So, yeah, the rib, ribs are a bend test test. Yeah, that's what I did, the bend test. Hey, let me ask you. I also, have, I've watched the guy. Uh, there's a guy in PBS. I forget his name, but it's Barbecue University or something. 
and he is big keen on ribs when they'll shrink back. So they'll show the the ribs will show a quarter inch reveal on the bone, and you know when they've shrunk back, then they're ready to right. they're ready to pull off. Hey, Ken was asking, and this is a great question uh, in chat. He says, so what's the what do you guys think the best value slash or best value for a grill slash style is to get started with? So. Mark, if you're you've you've gone through a gazillion grills, so Mike, I'll give you time to think about this one. What do you think if somebody's starting and they're like, mm, I want to jump in this and it ease, cost, and value? What do you think somebody starts with, Mark? My Acorn. Really, two ninety nine. Two it's two ninety nine, three ninety nine. Like we pay yeah. four hundred bucks up here. You can find them on sale at Menards. You can find them on sale a bunch of places. I've seen guys walk out for one hundred and fifty bucks. Um, very hackable. They got a little bit of work on it. Like I've I've got um. I'm using a Weber grate inside mine. I'm using a piece of stone from Lowe's. I'm using uh, fire bricks. I'm using um, RTV sealant. Um, tons of different ways, things you can hack on it. Tons of parts for it. Great community for them. And I can do everything on it. I can smoke on it. I can direct grill on it. I can, when I'm doing my steaks, I actually have an, a second grill I put in that holds my ash, my charcoal higher up. Um, I can do the pizza on it. I can bake on it. I can low and slow on it. Uh, it it's... Everything you want to do with it, you can do with it. It's the most versatile grill I have, and it's the one if I had to get rid of all my other grills and go back to one, it's one I would keep. And I've got two other – I have one other friend that's already bought one, and I have another friend who's trying to find one right now on sale because they've, they've seen my food. And, and it's it does everything a Weber can do. A Weber is slightly bigger, but because it's insulated, it's a lot more forgiving, but there's a learning curve to any sort of charcoal grill. And and because it's charcoal, then do you recommend a, a chimney uh, start no. for each of your no? No, when I use a chimney on that, I end up going. I end up I end up overshooting my fire. All I do for that is I, I use non petroleum based fire starters. They're little uh, sawdust or paper and wax, mm -hmm. and I dig a pit in the middle of the hole, light that with a little torch, let it run for five minutes, then put a piece of, of lump on top of the fire, and close the lid and set the vents. But there is definitely a learning curve on anything charcoal because it's all based on airflow. Yeah. So you, you got to stop on the way up. If it gets too hot, especially on that thing, if that thing gets too hot, you can't get it back down easily. Where like a Weber, you can just close it down for a little bit. It slows down. There's so much insulation in that thing that if it goes up to 400, you're waiting half an hour, 45 minutes to get down to 350 unless you know how to cool it down. But okay. as, as far as the universal one, it's, it's, uh, it's one I recommend to people all the time that want to get into it. So in the U.S. here, uh, just a little over 300 on Amazon. If you're uh, if you're into that, uh, Mike, what do you think? Well, I I have had charcoal and I love the taste of charcoal, but I'm more of a gas grill guy. And there's just a, a monster load of choices. Char, you know, trouble oil, um, uh, any of those that you can. I think that's what I'm using now. Is and there's just a whole bunch of choices at any price level you want. So I like I like the gas grill because you can get it up and going really fast, and it's a little more forgiving. If you overshoot, you can drop it back down pretty easily, uh, and, and that's for grilling. If I'm going to smoke, I think if you get into smoking, the pellet grills and, and my new thing is the pellet grill is the way to go because it's first for the beginner, an offset smoker. You're going to be fighting that the temperature all the time, and as you try and learn, you're going to be frustrated. And if you're doing, you're going to be doing uh, beer can chickens for months trying to get yourself, you know, the experience to do it. And you're going to think you're good to go and you're going to do something like a brisket and it's just not going to work out the way you wanted to. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go for a stick burner now. Like, yeah. Even if a barbecue went for three years, I would not, the, the, the stick burners are too intimidating for me. Yeah, I, I think you don't have to get a big one like I do. You know, Traeger makes smaller ones. Rectech makes a smaller one. Uh, there's a few uh, Yoder, I think, is is another brand. Yoder may be a little more expensive. Uh, there's Gorilla, Gorilla, so there's multiple brands out there. Uh, Rectech, I don't believe, is any show. You can't go to any showroom and see it except for their own in Augusta, Georgia. But you can see them online, and there's plenty of videos out there where you can go and see them. Tony uh, Tony Rayner just tweeted uh, Home Gadget Geeks podcast with Jay Collison, and I have now discovered meat glue. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tony, I have two. To be honest with you, I, I did not. Uh, I did not know there was such thing as a meat glue. But I would imagine with bacon, that would be really handy to kind of hold, because now you're using the bacon kind of as as a wrap to hold everything in place while it's cooking. And that we know on our turkey, when I, we put bacon on the top of that, it will cook itself apart. 
you know, I do a weave, and over the course of two or three hours, that bacon actually cooks itself kind of apart, and it falls apart. When I go to pull it off the turkey, it's it's gooey and not, when you think of bacon, this is not, what. even though it's been on the grill cooking at 170, 180, or 200 degrees, whatever it is, it is not the bacon you're used to. So I pull that off, put it back on the grill, and, uh, and then re-season, because my cast iron now has been cooking dry for three hours, right? It's been heat, no meat. It dries out that cast iron, and then I put the bacon back on there, re-season it, and oh, man, that's – listen, the burgers that I cook right after I cook the turkey, yes, <laughs> yes, because they've been re-seasoned completely with bacon. That's one and, thing. Uh, if, I, if I do steaks or I do pizza on my grill, because it gets so high temperature, I have to re-season my grill when I'm done with it because it actually burns all the oil out of the grill. Yeah, and how do you do that? What's your what's your choice for for the receipt? I, I cheat. I use um, I wait till it gets down in temperature a little bit, and I spray it with Pam. Oh, okay, pretty simple. Um, yeah, and again, charcoal has no open flame if you do it right, so you can spray it pretty easily without having major flare ups. Flare up, yeah. Um, but I'll actually use it at the same time to clean my grill. So it's every once in a while I'll have a, I'll do a steak or a pizza, and I'll have flames that are going out the top vent. Like they're they're two feet high just on the grease that's just lighting up from the from all the slow and lows I do. Um, it's it's uh, getting back to what what uh, Mike said. I was gas, and when I made the switch to charcoal, it was because I wanted to try something different. But I can have my I can have my acorn up to 400 degrees cooking chicken in 20 minutes. Yeah, that's good. Um, that's good. And, and I have a friend of mine that I got him a, uh, a grill for his birthday that I found cheap, a Weber that I bought for his birthday. And he kept on saying, yeah, when my kids get older, I'm going to get one, and I don't have time to do it now. Well, I brought it to him in May, and they were down last weekend, and his wife looked at me. She says, thank you so much for getting that grill. He <laughs> says, we're using that every weekend. And I said, well, you just proved to yourself that it doesn't take a lot of time to do charcoal grilling. Mm-hmm. He goes, no. Yeah. He says, it's 20 minutes, and we're up and running. I would tell you that I prefer the taste of a charcoal grill. Um, I just I'm I want the easiness of the gas it's grill. A commitment. Yeah. yeah, it's faster for sure, and you but can you can move quicker. What, I, and I find myself doing more. Grill. Yeah, I find myself doing more on the on the smoker now. And my wife will use a smoker. My wife's really? looking at doing a fish dish this weekend on the smoker on the Traeger, because all she has to do is turn the dial. Yeah, that's the thing. Just set easy the temperature. Get it going. Yeah, yeah, the technology makes that easy to get it going. And she wouldn't light the gas grill. By the way, that auger system, that's yeah. how it back in like a, a early 1900s was the way we heated our homes. That was the uh, the yeah. very first thermostat was that idea. An auger, you'd put coal in there, and that would drop that into the hopper into a bin, and you could you could go overnight without having to re, you know, restock. Cause we, we forget today how convenient this is, but 100 years ago, people were waking up in the middle of the night and stoking the, <laughs> the, you know, the, the, uh, the coal fire uh, just for your house. So, Mike, you had one more thing you wanted to show well, there? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, and I was going to say that you know, the, the pellet smokers, there's not really that much new tech in there. The, the P, PID controllers are maybe, uh, I don't know how new those are, but um, putting them in the grill and doing all that kind of stuff, maybe combining everything is somewhat new. Uh, but I think it's just catching on more now. Traeger did this a couple, decades ago when they invented this, uh, the pellet grills. But you know, you know it, with all this talking, you know, and we talked about the bear claws that I, whoops, bear <laughs> claws I have. You do need some gloves too. So you know, I use these, which are rubber insulated gloves. Um, there to take my meat off, and but they do have a temperature. I don't know if you can tell there, but that's a little burnt. <laughs> uh, a little, use, little too close to the fire. If you I hold on. Gloves. If you hold on to uh, what? I use welding gloves. That will work. Yeah. Work if you too. hold on to the hot meat too long, it will come through there. So I have those for taking the meat off, and then when I was using charcoal, I have these beast armor things, and you literally could pick up the charcoal and move it around. Really? With your hand, yeah. As long as you didn't hold it in your hand for five minutes or something. Yeah. I mean, I could literally pick up charcoal, move it around, and not be burnt. I'm looking for those right now. <laughs> I've, I've burned through my, my I've lifted up the grate off my grill before and I've burnt through my welding gloves wow yeah that would be uh, that's hot yeah that is hot I've um I've had dreams uh, not really but um, my thought would be my next grill although I think I'm going to have to replace the one I have first but um, I wanted to get a Weber a larger one of the larger Webers that have the where the side grates come up 
And mm-hmm. so then you have the smoke boxes right down on the side, and you can, you know, um, you can drop that. You just, you know, fold up the grill, drop your, drop the sticks down in there, close those back up, and you get some. Although I don't, it's on a Weber. I, you know, you could turn it into a smoker. It would be, it would work pretty well on the the traditional Webers, but. I'm not. I don't know if I have the patience for smoking um, meat at this point. It, it's it's a long. Well, you guys talk about these you know, twelve and thirteen and fourteen hour processes, and I'm like, ah, I don't know. Yeah, well, I'll find, only, I'm going to move closer to Mark. <laughs> that's only for roasts. Like I do ribs in four or five hours. Yeah, no. Do ribs not. in the afternoon. Well, you know, Jim, when I was doing the offset smoker, and it needed constant attention to at least the way I was doing it because I was not that experienced. Constant attention for me, it really got on to me. You know, my Fitbit, I was hitting 10,000 steps every time I was <laughs> I was smoking. Um, but, you know, once you do something like a, a pellet smoker where you say 225 or whatever temperature you're, you're cooking at, you really only have to go deal with it when it's time to do something with the meat, to spray it or whatever else. So I'm actually finding on a smoke day, it's a fairly relaxing day. I, you know, once I get the meat ready and put it on there, uh, it's a fairly relaxing day. I come down on my computer. I have my thermostat, my um, whatever the innovation uh, remote uh, temperature thing down here, and I'm able to work on the podcast, do whatever else, or watch TV. Yeah. You know, watch. Keep hitting that thing. Watch the Olympics. Uh, so it's, do, it's fairly easy. If I'm doing a pork shoulder for 14 hours, I put it on and I don't touch it again until it's off. Yeah. So I put it on at nine o'clock at night and they take it off at eleven o'clock in the morning. Good, so, good for a Friday night, Saturday morning type thing, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 We, it, it, I was mentioned three, two, one earlier on with the ribs, and if, if, unless we have some other stuff to show, I'm ready okay. to talk. Keep going. Yeah. So three, two, one is a is a um, method of cooking your ribs that says three hours on the smoker, you know, just naked, just just on the smoker, two hours wrapped in aluminum foil. And then one hour back on the smoker naked, and you're generally doing it around 225 or something like that. I have never had that work out to be exactly three hours, two hours, one hour. It always requires a little bit more. But the, the during that two hour, let me let me really get you going during that two hour thing while it's wrapped in aluminum foil. So what you do is you bring it inside, you put it on maybe double insul- double thing of aluminum foil. I take a margarine, squeeze butter. <laughs> put a big old line of margarine squeeze butter on that thing. Then I put a bunch of brown sugar on it, then a bunch of honey, and then some apple juice, and then seal that thing up so it won't no, nothing's going to get out of that. Put that back on a smoker for a couple hours as it's wrapped, and um, and then take it back off and put it back on, um, you know, for an hour at the end of it. And you're not getting a butter flavored, you know rib here. What you're getting is just super moist, really good ribs. And the mistake I made last time is when I put the apple juice in there as something else just to add moisture, I put apple juice from the refrigerator and I think that that cold apple juice that I put in there caused me to have to go two extra hours on the smoke. Ah. But, but man, there's, there's, go ahead. There's two camps of, of how you do ribs. So yeah. we tried wrapping and we don't anymore. Because I like, and my wife likes the the the, uh, the texture when you have to pull the meat away from the bone a little bit. Yeah. And when we found that when you wrapped it, literally the bone would just you pull the bone out. Yeah. So you get the two camps, and and neither one of them is right and wrong. It's just different tastes and different people. Yeah. I I would prefer bone out. That would be for me. I I would like that experience of cutting and then just pulling the bone and then mm-hmm. just eating the meat at that point, especially in a slow cook, where that meat would just be very very tender. And uh, and delicious. And you, you also get big camps on what barbecue style is better. So I'm I'm a, a vinegar. I like the, the really pungent, sharp. You walk in the door and you smell the sauce as as a really sort of slapping the face a little bit. Yeah. My wife likes the the smoky, mellow sauce. So we we've had meals where we make a big pulled pork for people and like, haha, I got my sauce got used more than your sauce did type thing. Right? <laughs> And it, you know, this is so like like Mark was saying, there's there's no one way. I mean, it's all kind of different ways. Some people like their their um, they want their ribs dry, and then they'll use sauce if they want to. Some of them want them wet. I just last time I did them wet, where I use these, you know, it used to be whenever you use the mop brush, it was like almost like a paintbrush, um, type of thing. You know, now they have these silicone type um, brushes that are really good at picking up 
whatever you did. So I, this last time, and at the last hour or so of the smoke, I mopped mine, you know, with a, a barbecue sauce. Came out great. Nice. I think I got to go uh, to the store and get some meat. <laughs> let me, yeah, let me let me tell you, Marcus shared a lot of good stuff that makes me. I'm gonna have to go back and listen to this, and maybe Mark can give us some recipes and go do that. But here's another one. I, I don't know if you guys have tried something called burnt ends. Hmm. Do you know what that is, Mark? Yeah, it's a it's a piece of the brisket that are too small and they get a little um, tougher that you put them back into the sauce with it. So my understanding, and maybe I'm wrong, but uh, when you get a full brisket, it comes it's actually two chunks of meat. One is the point, and one is the flat, and between the two is a big hunk of fat. So the flat will finish because it's smaller, thinner meat will finish first. So you cook this thing, let's say for 20 hours. The um, the flat comes out and it's you know just amazing. You put it off into the like Mark mentioned earlier. You wrap it with foil. You put it in a, um, a blanket and you set it aside. Then you take the point and you cut off a lot of the fat and you chop it into squares, square-ish. So strips, then cut again. You put that into a, a pan, some kind of aluminum pan or something like that. You put some other kind of sauces like barbecue sauce or whatever you want in, into that thing. You take that and you put that back into the smoker for a couple hours. And so you got a double smoke on that with all those juices. And that it doesn't really get burnt, but it's double smoked. Mm -hmm. And it's um, you know extra long cooked, and it comes back out, and, and it's good because you know that thick chunk of meat on the point is going to probably need a little bit more cooking time than that thinner piece of the flat. And you don't want the flat to overcook. Right. Uh, Jim, you were asking before if we do any other if we smoke any sauces. Yeah. I do a smoked baked beans. Ooh, so yeah. we uh, I season up a pork loin with um, my magic dust, which is in that in the show notes. Is a recipe called magic dust. Um, I don't make, I don't, I modify recipes, but I don't make most of my own recipes up. So, Merit, you dust the, the pork loin with uh, magic dust. I smoked it for two hours, and then at the same time as I'm smoking it, I'm cooking beans on the stove with this recipe I have from a friend. And then you put all of them together with this, with a cubed pork loin into the smoker again, and you smoke it for three hours, stirring every half hour. And the smoke just goes over the beans and gives this wonderful, and it, make, wow. it makes about uh, six quarts of beans at a time. And it doesn't last very long. <laughs> yeah, and that's inside your uh, the ceramic, but but cast no, iron. No, that was I used use an aluminum pan for that one. Oh, okay. Oh, so flat aluminum pan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one like a lasagna pan that's like yeah, yeah, yeah. High. yeah. So nice. I make it takes six cans of beans to make it, and a liter or a, a quarter ketchup and some molasses, some brown sugar, I think, and some other stuff. And, you know, on, on top of all the different ways you can do this, there's all kind of different injections. There's all kind of different uh, rubs and sauces and everything. Some of my favorite, you know, I like the, um, the what is this called, Ben's Bangin' Brisket Rub from Rectech. So I get, I get some of that, some of the Rectech stuff. I have probably a dozen of their different sauces and, and rubs. I also am a big fan of uh, Meat Church. Uh, this is their... This is one of their rubs from Meat Church, and then one of their injections. I get it in. I get it in the bag. These are powders inside of these bags, and then you put them in something to, to inject um, them. Inject Mark, them do, you, or to do you do injection on on? And yep. I, okay. And the, the, is that is that for mostly chicken and turkey, or can you inject? No, I, I usually or? do it for pork. Okay. Um, that's where I think that's the only time I've ever used it is on a pork shoulder. Um. What I do is typically I try and find it on sale. So for whatever reason, Chinese New Year up here, they sell pork for a dollar a pound. So last couple of years I bought like a 25-pound pork shoulder and then butchered it at my kitchen counter and made a couple of uh, couple of nice-sized pork shoulders and, and wrapped them in foil and strand wrap and put them in the freezer and then break them out in the summer because Chinese New Year's in January sometime. Yeah. Um, but you and, can get uh, briskets too. I can't get briskets up here. Oh. Or if I get them, I'm paying $9 a pound. Yikes. It, wow. It's uh, it's steak price for for cheap meat. Yeah. Like I can get strip loin steaks for less than I can sometimes get uh, blade roast or, or uh, chuck roast. But what I was saying is you can you can inject even a brisket. Yeah, oh I yeah, yeah sorry, yeah, that's another one that they inject. People take beef broth or, or some uh, or something like that, some other any kind of liquid basically, and you can inject the brisket too. We're so used to buying uh, any more ham. 
ready to go. You know, it, you, you buy it at Easter, Christmas, whatever. You buy a spiral cut ham that's already, you know, you're basically just warming that thing up. Have either one of you taken a ham from from a raw state? So, Mark, you're saying no, yes. no, no. I took no. I took a spiral cut and I cooked a spiral cut on the barbecue. Okay. So but I got charcoal spiral, spiral cut. cut pre cooked or, yeah. or okay. And you and you still but you still you warmed it up on the grill. Yeah, and then I put the glaze like we get them up here with the glaze separate. So I put it in a pan and I put it on the charcoal smoke and so I I charcoal smoked my spiral cut glazed ham. <laughs> <laughs> Which has probably some smoke flavoring, but they don't smoke those before you get them, right? No, they're smoked a little bit, but little bit. it's still nice and like the 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 flavor profile you get from a charcoal is different from gas. Mm -hmm. it, it's not as as uh, and the acorn is a lot more moist cooking environment, so it doesn't dry out as much. Um, they don't dry out a lot to begin with, but we have them at home one time for Thanksgiving or Easter, so I was like, I'm gonna do this on the grill. Yeah. And this year, I'm talking about if I can get my family up here, we're gonna do a turkey on one of the grills. Yeah. I love the turkey. Love the turkey. That's my favorite thing to cook that way. And, and I imagine that would be great. Oh, hold on, let me show that. It's just the chicken I did. I mean, look how look how gorgeous that looks. Oh man, doesn't that look good? That does look good. Yeah, we might be doing chicken this weekend. Yeah, <laughs> that is a good looking chicken, and it was good too. It tasted really good. Yeah. Um, something y'all mentioned. I just I was just wanting to say something, but I forgot. But um, yeah, I've injected. Uh, it, we were talking about ham. Did you have something to say on the on the ham side? No. Uh, I have injected uh, some of my meats. I've injected, of course, some chicken. I've injected um, – what else? I didn't inject ribs. But I just got this injector thing I showed earlier. Um, so I, that's something I want to try and, and start injecting more. And I got some, some new injection seasoning from Meat Church. Cool. I, I know normally we don't post show notes on the on the forum or on the, um, the Facebook page, but with the amount of things we've talked about, it might be worth posting some show notes this time. Yeah, well, they'll definitely be in. Uh, I will take these and put them in the, the the actual post, so they'll be in the center section of the post, and then I'll I'll reference it back to the Facebook group to say, hey, look, everything, because you guys did an incredible job on the show notes here. So we'll make sure that uh, that folks know, hey, come look at the show notes uh, here at uh, the Average Guy TV. And I, I love talking barbecue. So if anybody ever wants to hit me up on Facebook to talk barbecue, I'm I'm more than we happy to talk does. more about it. That's for sure. Because I, I think there's a there's a quite a few of us that probably listen that are on the Facebook page to have some you know have the barbecue talk uh, or or grill talk either way. Mike, what are you showing? I remember what I was gonna say. So this is my smoker, and you can see the smokestack on the right hand side. There is an attachment you can get that that fits where that smokestack is and where the little handle is, and those things move off to the side. It's called a cold smoker box. So you add this off to there, so the heat coming through that that pipe. And you'd put, you know, fish in there. You put cheese in there, or maybe you just want to warm something. You put that in there, and it, it does like a cold smoke. So cheese, you don't want to cook at 250. You'd melt the cheese. Um, but maybe you just want to smoke flavor the cheese, and you'd stick it in this cold box. I don't have it here, so I'm just showing you where it would go. Um, I'll see. I can see if I can find it online. That's a that's a big um, that's another whole. I don't do it, but that's another whole talk. There, there's off a of barbecue, you get a whole bunch of other. Um, Subforms like there's another one called charcuterie, and where guys are just making their own sausages and rolled meats, and and uh, again the guys that are heavily into it. Yeah, so here's the the cold smoker that you would get that attaches to the side of my grill, and it's got three cooking things. And each each stage of here is a dramatically different temperature. I think from the bottom to the top could be a 150 degree difference in temperature. So depending on what you cook and what you want. Um, you know how much heat you want in this cold smoke. You would put it on the different rack. And what's the difference? Oh, like I've that. seen these. Okay, so but I've seen those standalone boxes, or I see people who have these. They look like gun racks, but they're smokers. Yeah, so, vertical smokers. Is that and so I'm assuming uh, same kind of deal, either pellet or whatever at the bottom, and those, that is making its way up. Is that how that works? Those typically they'll either use. Um, there's a company called Bradley that makes electric smokers, and they use wood pel uh, wood pucks that are an automatic feeding into it, or you can get uh, propane powered, or you can get full electric and you just put uh, chips on the bottom, or you can get an offset firebox and use smoke. So there, there's a number of varieties of, of types of barbecues and smokers, and um, <laughs> it, it's I, I picked ones that were fairly safe to learn on, it's fairly easy to learn on. An offset smoker, from everything I read, was one of the hardest things to learn on. I looked at buying a, an Oklahoma Joe 
mm -hmm. offset. And one reason I didn't was that we don't have a big supply. Even though we're in Canada and we have wood everywhere, trying to find smoking wood is, is about a four-hour drive for me. And it's not that cheap. Um, and number two, everything I write on it is it can be a real pain and you're adding splits every half hour to keep this thing going. And it seemed like yeah. way too much work. That's what I was fighting. And it, it really, unless you were, you figure it out and you get really good at it fast or you enjoy the process, which I didn't, uh, an offset smoker like that can really be discouraging. And like, you know, in the past, like I've had, I think, almost seven, eight years now, and I've probably done five smokes on it. Where I bought the Rectech in June, and I've already done you know more than a half dozen smokes on it. So you know it's and the only reason I don't do them every weekend is because my wife says that's too much. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm on the opposite side. That when I talked about selling my Weber, my the Smoky Mountain, um, my wife says you're not allowed selling it. <laughs> I would smoke something every Saturday and Sunday if my wife let me. <laughs> That's enough, Mike. That's and I like that. That's enough. Yeah, we we're you know uh, I'm a recreational. I'm a griller, right? And so we do burgers, dogs, chicken, um, a turkey, and uh, and I keep it pretty simple. One of the things um, I've I've honestly wanted to get, and this is kind of off a little bit off topic, but I've wanted to add a uh, a um, burner to my grill. Yeah. And then I had a buddy who used to take a disc, like a um, he would get a uh, like a Disc that would go on a farm implement. So think about, I mean, a big. It would be a big disc pan. He would season those up and then turn that into a wok, and he'd have somebody put, you know, handles, uh, weld two handles onto the side, and he would grill and wok uh, at the same time mm -hmm. and get that thing real hot, and you could throw stuff in there and do it that way. And I always thought that would be a fun, you know, fun thing to do to have that extra pan. A million different ways to do that, but uh, it would be I fun. Do it right do you? Yeah. yeah I'd I rather have... walk outside. That's that's funny to say it that way. But I'd rather cook on a walk outside uh, than I would inside because uh, just because of kind of sometimes I can get messy and yeah. and you know some some of those pieces. So both so, both my Acorn and my Weber have a, a center section that comes out, and uh, I had a, I picked up a stainless steel wok and cover at a yard sale a couple weeks ago, and so on the Weber I put it. A couple inches below, I have a basket of, of charcoal and get the thing nice and hot and then toss in some shrimp and some vegetables and you can cook yeah. indirect on the side of it and you cook in the middle of it for the regular stuff. Yeah. yeah. There's something I'm about seeing, cooking outside that makes it more fun. It just is. And I think it tastes better. Um, I'm seeing a lot of girls coming with that center section now where you can pull that yeah. out and and, uh, and do more things. So mm -hmm. pretty cool. Hey, any tech, any more tech things that we didn't cover? Mark, Mike, anything when we think of gadgets? As we uh, as we kind of bring this in for landing, it's gonna be a long show. I'm gonna do it all in one. But uh, any other gadgets, Mike? No, I can't think of anything. Okay. Mark? Like Mark's got something. Mark? I just picked this up. I've had this flashlight. This is a a double A Mac light flashlight that I've had since 1991, and I just picked up this kit the other day that converts it to LED. Ooh. So I have I have a number of flashlights. Like I'm buying. These things from China that are uh, like 2,000 uh, lumen. <laughs> um, they're using, I think, called an 18650 battery that is equivalent to three AAAs, lithium ion. I don't think. I think this one's empty. Um, so I'm buying all these ones. And then the other day, I'm like, you know what? I like this little mag light. Um, I wonder if I can find an LED kit for it. And it's a 140 lumen kit, and it gives you a new. Um, I got two of them because the first one's defective, but it gives you a new plate that fits into the. Uh, flashlight and a new reflector. So I use that. I have things like this thing that I get from work, which is a uh, where's the camera? There it is. It's a magnetic base. It's a magnetic back, and it's got a hook on it. And there's 40 bulbs, I think, in here, 40 LEDs. And then there's more at the end of it. And it's magnetic, so I can stick it on the edge of my barbecue if I want to see what I'm doing. Because mine, unfortunately, doesn't have a light like Mike's does. Um, you ever thought about wearing one of those headlamps? That's I, I have one. I, I went and bought one that's, that that uh, I haven't used yet for, for the same sort of reason. Um, using four grills, I haven't got lighting set up yet to be able to go to all four grills. So two are in the op upper deck and two are in the bottom deck. You need to put together an overhead uh, suspension lighting where you can kind of swing, you know, <laughs> swing that light around, bring it in, set it for the various grills. Well, I work for an electrical company, so I should be able to just get an outdoor street lamp and just yeah. light up my entire backyard when I hit a switch. <laughs> well, sometimes it's a little in the, in the dark when you're grilling in the winter. 
it's nice to have that light that's, yeah, definitely. you know, I've got overhead light and some other things outside, but it's really nice to get that light into the grill. So um, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, uh, I've got a little Craftsman. You, know, you can get these at Sears, so if you can find that anymore. I'm a big Craftsman guy, but nice little light too. I just take out um, if I need it from that standpoint. I have not done a headlamp. I don't, in the winter, I don't do as much. I should do more. But I just oh, we, we don't either. I, I might use my grill. Well, first off, I got to shovel off the deck. So last winter we had three times that I had to shovel two feet of snow off the deck. Yikes! Um, and it was a new deck, so I'm careful about using the shovel with it. Um, but if I do that, that time that I told you I put my my uh, pork shoulder into a cooler for five hours or seven hours, it was New Year's Eve. It was minus 30 Celsius when I pulled it off at five o'clock in the morning. So I cooked it overnight from 9 o'clock at night till 5 o'clock in the morning, and it was done early. I wasn't planning on being done at 5 a.m. So I was out there in my pajamas at 9 at minus 30 at, my, at 5 degrees in the morning, or 5 a.m., nice. pulling this thing off. Damn. But it can't kept it warm until 7 a.m. But good. meat is meat is done when meat is done, and that's right. one big thing on this stuff. The low and slow stuff is done when it's done. John's asking in the chat room, oh, what about using one of those smoker tubes with propane? Mike, can you use that on? Absolutely. Mid yeah, the, the smoke tube. Yeah, the, the yeah. photo I showed earlier with the burgers that was on my propane grill, my gas grill. Okay, I have to try one of those smoke tubes. You can get those. Yeah, it's cheap. I've done a bucks. smoke box. You know, I bought a cast iron smoke box, and the thing rusted on me, and you know, it, it just wasn't it wasn't very convenient, and it didn't work yeah. very well. And you need so, to get pellets. This has to have pellets. I, you yeah. maybe get a jam wood into it, but pellets are the way to go. No, yeah. So you you would get the tube, you would jam it full of pellets. Do you just then? Do you have to light it? Like, yeah, you uh, use a propane torch or, or a little um, <laughs> little torch or a heat gun. People light it with heat guns too. I have a propane torch. You know, uh, one of those attachments to it where you just click it and it sets it on fire. And so I do that. You let it. You set it on fire, then you let it smolder, and then it'll go. Um, one of the more low tech thing is, you know, I'm buying all these different pellets. These and you got you can't let them get wet because once they they're like, what's that kind of particle board? Once it gets wet, it expands and it's just no good. Um, so you got to keep them dry, and I have I want I don't want to mix and match these things. I got, you know, hickory and maple. I want them all completely separate. So I bought some five-gallon buckets from Lowe's, and I bought these little tops. These little, you know, screw-on tops on the five-gallon bucket. So you attach the thing to the five-gallon bucket, that is the con you know converter or whatever it is, and then this thing just screws on top of it. So and it cre and it has a seal. So then you seal your five-gallon bucket. You're, 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 even if it rains on them, and mine does, mine's in a place where it's going to get rain on them. There's no moisture getting down into the pellets, and then it's super easy to open back up. You just twist the thing and open back up, and you're ready to pour them into your Great hopper. Idea. Yeah, yeah that, I looked at getting those. They're sixteen dollars Canadian. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's the nicest country in the world, but it's pretty expensive. <laughs> so I, I went and bought the ones, the same idea, but I went and bought them from uh, Home Depot, and I bought the snap-on lids, and I'm just getting strong hands from opening them up all the time. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, for seven, and even here, seven dollars and twenty-eight cents. That's more than I wanted to pay for a lid, but I figured, eh, I want the convenience of taking it off, so I did yeah. buy it. Yeah. Well, gents, hour and uh, forty-five. Maybe one of the longer ones we've done, but I think uh, some good. We'll leave it all in one, and if you've made it to this part of the podcast, you are super engaged, and uh, I don't know why you wouldn't be. Uh, Mark mentioned a couple times we have very detailed show notes, and those will be out at theaverageguy.tv slash HGG275 if you're listening to this later. Um, those will be out there. Just go to theaverageguy.tv. Look in the Home Gadget Geek section. I almost said Home Tech. Home Gadget Geek section and look for episode 275 if you want to do it that way. You can always search HGG275 to get to it. There will be very extensive show notes and uh, in a lot of the things that we talked about. Mike left a lot of links for some YouTube uh, stuff that he watches. Uh, Mark was very good about every piece of gear we talked about. It has an Amazon link or some kind of a link associated with you want to go back and purchase it. Don't forget... You are purchasing from uh, Amazon. Use the Amazon affiliate link there, the average guy start at the average guy.tv slash Amazon. We'll get you there, and uh, we always appreciate that. You guys have been super good to me about doing that as well. Mark and Mike, thanks for jumping in here, and uh, and I hope uh, you're hungry at this point, right? I know yeah. I am. <laughs> I am. I am too. Hang tight. We'll uh, we'll do a few minutes of post show when we're done here as I uh, as I kind of wrap this. 
just a reminder if you've got any uh, if you've got some ideas for some shows if you want to do a show if you've got some kind of thing you want to jump on here mark as we started talking about all this stuff in the facebook group i said nah, maybe we need to talk about barbecue tech or grill tech mike jumped in and said i want to i want in on that and uh, and so a show was born. Lopta had left a little tweet for me. He won't hear this because he doesn't listen to my my food shows about technology. But he had said on Twitter, um, "I'm sad that I missed Home Gadget Geeks now, but I know it's okay because I skipped the food episodes." Well, I don't skip any food ever, and so we're glad that you've made it this far. And if you got some ideas for uh, some shows you'd like to do, uh, you want to jump in or. Like Eric did a couple of weeks ago, he hooked me up with uh, JC over there at uh, at um, Reset Plug. If you've got somebody, it's helpful if you know them or you can reach out to them for me. Sometimes if you're an avid customer, and I think I'm going to get the guys from Drobo back on here uh, as we get into winter, but if you're an avid customer, oftentimes they'll say yes, so help me do that. Send me an email, jim at theaverageguy.tv, and we can get that done. A reminder that the Average Guy TV platform, both web and media hosting, hosted by and powered by Maple Grove Partners. Get secure, reliable, high-speed hosting. Starts at 10 bucks, so it's super cheap to get in there every single month if you want to start a WordPress blog or you're thinking about doing your own podcast, which I'd totally encourage you to do if you thought about doing it. Uh, you can get those from Maple Grove Partners. Just head over to maplegrovepartners.com. And by the way, let me just say, most podcasters have to do hosting and media hosting, and most of the media hosting is 20 bucks all by itself. So 10 bucks gets you in. Great deal. Maple Grove partners.com. Thanks for, thank uh, Roger over at WLMN Radio as we broadcast out of Grafton, West Virginia, and uh, we thank them for doing that as well. They do that each and every week. I think this could be the highest rated show this week, uh, although we only get a one-hour slot over there. I'm wondering what Roger's going to do as we, uh, as we go this far. I should have said at the 57-minute mark, okay, Grafton, West Virginia, you're getting cut off. <laughs> you might want to head over to theaverageguy.tv and finish it up. But maybe they will know that, and we thank Roger for that as well. Don't forget to use the uh, the app, especially if you're traveling. I am coming into a season of traveling uh, here, and um, a lot of the shows, although I am not going to leave you high and dry, as we think about shows, typically I just take the week off. However, changing things a little bit, we interviewed uh, Aaron Lawrence out at um, – she's a blogger, tech blogger. And we talked about that robotic mower. She got a chance to test it, and uh, that robot, I should say, that robot mower. She got a test, a chance to test it for a, a month or so, and so I brought her on. We recorded that on Monday. That will air next Thursday. So when we're out, I'll have it up and ready to go on the site. Uh, and it, so you can come out Thursday night if you want. There is some, uh, there is some word that there's going to be a little, a uh, little Xbox gaming party. Uh, and so John had mentioned that. He's out there in the chat right now, and he's going to set that up. John will put a link to that. If you want to do that Thursday, then there's no show to listen to, although, I'll, again, I'll have the show up if you want to listen to what I recorded. It'll come through the feed as regular, so no worries there. But John will be available during this time if you want to do that. He's going to post that into the chat room. I'm sorry, into the Facebook group uh, if you want to do that next week. While I'm out, I'm actually getting a chance to meet John out in Washington, D.C., so I'm heading out there, and uh, we're going to do dinner on Tuesday. Uh, busy Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, back. I've also got some recruiting recruiting tricks, trips coming up. I'm having a hard time saying that. It's been a long night. But uh, then we got Chad Bostic coming back. Uh, Chad's from Hello Pro, te or hellotechpros.com. Uh, he's going to talk about his gear the next week is the meetup, and I will actually have interviews from uh, Heartland Developer Conference that will have been I've done the week before, so those will be available. We're actually off three weeks at that point for live shows, so I'll have recorded pre-recorded shows for you, just the way it's stacked up this year. Headed down to Dallas for some recruiting, uh, be in Lincoln, Nebraska for another week. So, and then we're back with Joel Rushworth. As we talk about Windows Phone, this is interesting because we all think Windows Phone is dead, and uh, Joel is a Windows Phone MVP, and he is going to come back as well. And then in a couple weeks, Amber Gott's back from last week. So a lot of things coming up. We, uh, we're excited for it, and, and uh, we've got uh, some things going on. Again, all those things that you do for us, I appreciate, and uh, I appreciate you guys for coming back on and everybody else for listening this long. We're here live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central. I'll oh, say that, and then I say I'm taking three weeks off, but most Thursdays. 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out at the average guy.tv live. Thanks for staying around. With that, we'll say goodnight, everybody.